started. Number 10, marriage. Your good women have lost a marriage into war, famine, disease, and disaster. I know some might think initially that this isn't a punishment, but in the cases of the Victorian women, the societal status of being a woman was only seen based off of the ideologies that needed to be pure and clean. Your bodies were seen as temples, and it shouldn't be decorated with jewelry, nor should it be used for physical activities or your own personal pleasures. You couldn't oppose men, and you being wealthy or a spinster was the only exception. Single women were looked down on with shame and pitied, and as your main purpose as a woman was to marry and reproduce. Even young girls at the age of 8 to 12 would stop working, as if there was no child labor laws or protection laws for children, and as, soon as they, and as soon as these women or young girls were able to menstruate, they would be negotiated into marriage and no longer be able to sustain themselves financially or just be a kid. And being a poor married woman wasn't an option as you had no individual rights under law. Married women were only seen as one with their husband and the husband would be the manager and entitled to all of your properties, as it was seen more as a business and you were being micromanaged constantly until death do you part. Number nine, no rights. As I mentioned with marriage, women didn't have any rights as they were seen primarily as second class citizens and if you were a woman of color, my goodness, you were definitely seen less than human. Women who had to be married ended up losing everything they owned, inherited or earned and it would belong to their husband. Once a woman married, of any property she owned as well as any income she received from it passed her husband. Although he could not dispose of it without her consent, her property, her personal property such as money or earnings or investments and personal belongings such as jewelry passed absolutely into his control. She could not part with them without his consent and if you were in a loveless marriage or a harmful one, you couldn't divorce your husband. Divorce wasn't even a concept for women to execute without losing their own amenities, even in the court of law until the 1970s, almost a hundred years or so later, after the spark of the women's suffrage movement in the mid-1800s. 18 late in the mid late 1800s. So men had the right to divorce his wife under the grounds of adultery, but women had to prove her husband was unfaithful combined with other allegations including cruelty, bigamy, incest, and so on. Luckily, in the 1857 act, divorce did become a bit easier little by little, but again, only under the impression that the woman had legal grounds and proof her husband was unfaithful with evidentiary support to back up her claims. And even then, she could finally earn some of her possessions. As for the husbands, if he wanted to divorce his wife, he didn't have to do anything. He could just say it and it would be fine. Number eight, no education. To me, education is extremely important as it was something I learned growing up in my family. That education liberates you to understand yourself, those around you, and the world better. And for women in this era, they were received less education than men. They were banned from universities and could only obtain low income paying jobs as she was not allowed to follow a profession as they were all close to women. And the irony of them having Queen Victoria as the reigning accolade of this era, a woman and women of these times couldn't get an education to liberate herself or her children from defamation if the husband no longer sees her as a useful asset. So for women, especially those who could afford it, was raised in a privileged household with financial backings and exceptional family background, her education was only seen as accomplishments. Like, oh darling, she's a very accomplished woman. It's something you might hear in these type of movies that depict the era. Which only indicates that she had artistic talents like singing, dancing, and knowing foreign languages, and anything to help earn them a husband, and be a benefit in the house. Even doctors at this time believed that if a woman studied too much education, she would stunt her ability to reproduce. Wild as hell. And when university allowed women to attend their lecture halls, their families would actually forbid them from going, worried that it would prevent them from finding a husband. Number seven, the right to work. Work was only available to those who had no choice, as their societal status prevented them from leveling up to the ladder to have a better life independently. Even more so women who were labeled as part of the working class, these women fueled the industrial revolutions, making up to 60 to 80% of the working force in light industries such as cotton manufacturing. Even more so those who were labeled as part of the working class, women of this era fueled the industrial revolutions, making up to 60 to 80% of the workforce in light industries such as cotton manufacturing. Women that had jobs outside of the home made them less likely to marry, leaving them with no choice but to stay in, in undesirable situations that made them undesirable themselves. In one study in the Buffalo State, in one study by the Buffalo State had noticed classing women and children together as helpless creatures needing the protection of strong men, they were indignant at the knowledge that women had to support themselves, that they had suffered degrading wrongs as working women. So for some, they'd have to result themselves into committing adult work, or even for some unfortunate circumstances, be sold into adult work as they had often had heavy debts from predecessors or even used as bargaining chips for their partners. Poor women were not regarded as the Victorian society as they could not fight back as men had captured these women, straight up kidnapping them, and kept them at their house. Differences in societal classes led to some women being ignored and unacknowledged in society for economic reasons and for the pleasures of some men. Women of the night had no exits of this profession and were stuck in this life, and they would be beaten, tormented, as this was obviously shamed on, as well as being arrested, which would lead us to number six. Number six, women who were in prison. In some revolutionary standpoints, being in prison might make you look like a hero or a villain, and as it depends 
of what you're doing or what you stood for. For the Victorian era, women who had been the most vocal at this time for a multitude of things like women's rights, the women who were caught in the act of selling their bodies in order to obtain financial means would be arrested and sent to prison. But even women who were not adult workers would be arrested. Women who had premarital pregnancies, turincies, or adultery, or kept bad company would also be arrested. They would be sent to prisons or reformities, as for women of these times, a small step off of the Victorian pedestal made for a long fall. Women sent to prison in the Victorian England were subjected to regimes whose projects was to enforce idealized femininity. This individualized treatment aimed at more regeneration than discipline and was administered by an entirely female staff aided by middle class philanthropic lady visitors. Considering women were placed only into two categories, being a wife and a mother, the reality is that they lived in a world that discriminated heavily against them. Due to their superior physical strength, men considered themselves the dominant sex and sought to keep women subdued for as long as they could. Number 5. Prison Life being accused of being an idle and disorderly woman seems like a very vague and inconvenient statement today as it holds no worthy of prosecution, but for these women of these times, you would definitely go to jail for that. These roughly defined offenses were common charges against women in the 18th century. At least in some records of the names of these women have survived, there are two on the list who are sadly identified only known as an unknown, unknown woman, cannot give any account of herself and the other being accused of being a vagrant and an idiot. Which of course being an idiot isn't a crime unless you're doing something idiotic that hurts another person then yeah, I guess being being an idiot is a crime. It is possible that up to two thirds of prisoners in the House of Corrections, like the one at the prison called the Wakefield House of Correction, were female. Beating hemp was the usual form of hard labor, as well as if the women refused to comply or being able to commit to task, women as well as if the women refused to comply or unable to commit to tasks, whipping and beatings were also a common place, particularly to those who convicted of vagrancy, lewd, con lewd conduct, and night walking. Number four, domestic harm. This is sort of stemming back to the whole marriage thing in number 10, as it basically ties in on how horrible life was being a woman in the Victorian era, or just being a woman in general in any historical time. With these sacrifices and determinations of these women as they ensure the women like me were able to gain access slowly but surely to equal rights, but sadly when it comes to marriage for some of these women, they're also at risk of being in harmful relationships that were extremely normalized at the time. Violence against women and the lack of protection was common as there were no laws for the physical violations they had to endure. After all, when you got married, everything you owned belonged to your husband and so did your body with or without consent. Domestic violence was an issue that captivated the Victorian imagination due to the unprecedented visibility that domestic harm began to receive in the press and the emergence of an ongoing debate during the 1840s and the 1850s. Domestic violence was an issue that captivated the Victorian imagination due to the unprecedented visibility that domestic harm began to receive in the press and the emergence of an ongoing debate during the 1840s and 1850s about the domestic harm and other marriage issues that affected women, like all laws that slowly opened gateways to other clauses, the 1828 Offenses Act that targets working class violence helped a cultural shift on the subject and domestic violence became a topic to the public. Number 3. The Angel of the House or the angel in the house. When it came to the liberation, it all stemmed with the women's rights groups fought for equality and over time made strides in attaining rights and privileges. However, many Victorian women endured their husband's control and even cruelty including sensual violence, verbal abuse, and economic deprivation. And there's no way out of it as it got worse as a man named Coventry Patmore published a book called Angel in the House. It consisted of poems and the ideal Victorian marriage and although it came from a place of grief at the loss of his first wife, the book had suddenly became a staple in women's behaviors and marriages and then became a standard of their status. A woman's proper role was to love, honor, and obey her husband. As her marriage vows stated, a wife's place in the family hierarchy was secondary to her husband but far from being considered unimportant. A wife's duty to tend to her husband and properly raise her children were considered crucial cornerstones of social stability by the Victorians. Representations of ideal wives were abundant in Victorian culture, providing women of their role models and the Victorian ideal of the tirelessly patient, sacrificing wife is what depicted the angel in the house. And for these middle class women, mimicking the angel in the house gave them more opportunities to find a successful match in marriage. Number two, the House General. The House General, in a term coined in 1861 by Isabel Beaton, by Isabella Beaton in her influential manual, Mrs. Beaton's Book of Household Management, because for women they needed a manual on how to be a good wife, a good woman, and a good so on and so forth, here she explained that the mistress of the house is comparable to the commander of an army or the leader of an enterprise. To run a, to run a respectful household and secure the happiness and comfort and well-being of her family, she must perform her duties intellectually and thoroughly. For example, she had to organize 
delegate and instruct her servants, which was not an easy task as many of them were not reliable. Isabella Beaton's upper class readers may also have a large compl complement of domestics, a staff requiring supervisions by mistress of the house. Beaton's advised her readers to maintain a housekeeping account book to track spending. She recommends entries and checking the balance monthly, but also keep in mind this is the same lady who told people to put borax in bread to save money. This may not seem like a big punishment for some viewers, but if you were told to this may not seem like a big punishment for some viewers, but if you were told that you needed a manual to how to live your life so you wouldn't be kicked out of society, that's not something that's a preference today, is it? And number one, asylum. Now, if you're a woman who was out of the realms and just didn't want to be part of society like everyone else, maybe just suffered a series of mental health issues or even just looked ugly, you might find yourself in an asylum. They had such ridiculous reasons to lock up a woman, as I mentioned in the prison section on this list, from being a vagrant, disorderly, or whatever the case was, you'd go to prison, or even more so, to the asylum. For some families, if they just didn't know what to do with you, they'd just toss you into the asylum for not being complicit. In an investigation by a very passionate and an amazing writer named Nellie Bly, she had experienced firsthand on the field of the mistreatments, the devastating conditions, and harm patients had to endure. In her report published in 1887, and later published in the book 10 Days in the Madhouse, it caused such a sensation it prompted the asylum to to implement reforms and shed the light on the significant impact on American culture. Anyways, being a woman was tough as hell in the Victorian era, but with their determination for the right to vote, the women's suffrage movement that enforced made lawmakers to ensure them to obtain sustainability today is the reason why there are so many generally incredible women who are able to become who they want to be. And it is important to note, those who do not know how to look back at where they came from will never get to their destination. So be sure to read up and learn a lot, after all the answer in our future is laid dormant in our past. Number 10, Drowning. Drowning as a form of punishment was not a common practice in ancient Egypt, at least as far as historical records and archaeological evidence indicate. The ancient Egyptians had a legal system with various forms of punishment, but the various methods were typically less severe than drowning. But in records of the Code of Hammurabi, which was one of the oldest and known legal codes in human history, it provided a comprehensive set of laws covering a wide range of aspects of daily life including civil, criminal, and commercial matters. One of the most famous aspects of the code is the principle of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, which laid out specific punishments for various offenses. Mentioning drowning if there was adultery with a neighbor's wife or if you had an intimate relations with your daughter-in-law, more or less these punishments would go both ways, but interestingly enough, the laws depended on the person. Number 9. Disinheritance in ancient Egypt, inheritance and property rights were complex and evolved over time, with some variations depending on the specific period and social status of individuals. Generally, women did have rights to inherit property, but there were significant differences between men and women in terms of inheritance. During the early dynastic periods, women had relatively more rights and they could inherit and own property. However, as the society became more stratified and centralized with the rise of the pharaonic state, inheritance laws became in favor more for males. By the time of the Middle Kingdom, women's rights to property and inheritance were were gradually eroded. Property, especially land, was usually passed from father to son. Women could gain property through marriage contracts, dowries, or gifts, which they could then pass on to their children. But if they lose their inheritance, so do their children. Thankfully, there was legitimate ways of structuring a will, making unequal distributions of disinheriting a person so to minimize challenges which do not involve corporal punishment. These include a gift conditional upon the recipient, not challenging the will, a no contest clause, diverting assets outside the will by writing a life insurance policy, and to trust or passing assets assets through the world to a secret trust. Number 8. Banishment in ancient Egypt, as in many ancient societies, the legal system was complex and the punishment for various offenses could vary depending on factors such as the severity of the crime, the societal status of an individual involved, and the time period in question. Banishment was one possible punishment, but it was not the common form of punishment. Banishment in ancient Egypt was being expelled from a community or city was generally used for serious offenses or crimes. It was a severe punishment because it meant the individual was cut off from their community and likely left to fend for themselves in the harsh environment outside settled areas. And for women, it was typically a rare occurrence as the legal system in ancient Egypt was based on the code of law that changed over time, and evidence suggests that women could be the subjected to various forms of punishments for their crimes, including banishment. Number seven. Punishment. More commonly, punishments for women in ancient Egypt might have included fines, corporal punishments, or forced labor. For serious crimes, especially those that threatened the social order or involved treason, more severe punishments like execution might be applied, but in some cases for less serious offenses, women might be required to pay fines. These fines could be in the form of money, goods, or livestock. Women, particularly those of lower social status, could be sentenced to perform labor as a form of punishment. This might involve agriculture work, construction, or other forms of manual labor. Depending on the nature of the offense, a woman 
woman's property or belongings could be confiscated as a form of punishment. As mentioned earlier, banishment was a possible punishment for serious offenses. Number six, beatings. In ancient Egypt, like in many ancient societies, corporal punishment, including beatings, could be a form of punishment for women, particularly for offenses that were considered serious or morally reprehensible according to the prevailing nature and culture and legal norms. It's important to note that the application of punishment varied depending on factors such as societal status and specific time period and the region within ancient Egypt. Corporal punishments such as whipping, beating, or other forms of physical punishment could be administered for various offenses. This might be more common for crimes like theft or adultery. Examples would be like switches, flexible branches, or vines could have been used for beatings. They would be capable of inflicting pain without causing severe injury, as wooden paddles with a flat surface could also be used for beating as well. They would also have been effective in delivering blows to specific areas of the body, and the simplest form of beating would be involved with the hands and fists. This method would also be easily accessible and wouldn't have to require any specialized tools, as well as whips, sticks, and rods. Number five, strangulation. Now for the more morbid section on this list, although stoning may seem like a common thing in this era as a form of capital punishment, whereas an individual is pelted with stones until death, actually was not common associated with ancient Egyptian legal practices based on available historical and archeological evidence. The primary method of execution in ancient Egypt was typically strangulation or impalement. Stoning as a form of capital punishment is more commonly associated with other ancient cultures in the region, such as ancient Mesopotamia or parts of the Levant. In these societies, stoning was indeed known as a form of capital punishment for various offenses, including adultery. Strangulation was the one of the most common methods of execution in ancient Egypt. It was typically used for serious offenses and could be applied for both men and women. In cases where capital punishment was seemed necessary, strangulation was a method of employed to carry out the sentence. Number four, lacerations. When it comes to corporal punishments, as I mentioned above, those who do commit adultery might deal with the consistency of beatings or lacerations. Texts speak of thrashing with a wooden stick give 10 to 20 to 50 to 100 or even 200 times. They also mention branding and mutilation of the nose and ears. Tomb reliefs often show beatings of people, but in most cases, these are private coercions of subordinates, not an official penalty. Sometimes the culprits are bound to a pillory. These punishments were all carried out in public and therefore also meant a loss of honor and degradation of the culprits. The results of these measures can be seen on many skeletons as they are also including cutting off limbs, noses, and other parts of the body as a form of punishment, specifically connected to adultery or if you were married, specifically a married woman. It is a crime deserving of death as it is easier to commit any other sin after that. The husband had a legal right to punish or forgive his wife or leave the court if the husband accuses the wife with no proof. The punishment of a man was much lighter and the woman of the crime of adultery as the Egyptians believed that offense falls primarily in the hands of the woman while the women would be killed as the men would severe just a thousand blows. Number three, burning alive. Referring back to the Code of Hammurabi, the code was enlisted under the morals and the laws in ancient Egypt and Babylon. When it came to intimate relationships with your close family, you'd be subjected to many listed punishments as in dealing with seduction or physically harming someone intimately. The Hammurabi inflicts the penalty of burning if you were to have a physical intimacy with your mother, but since this was ancient Egypt, unless you were a royal who needed to pull an epidus complex to maintain your rule, and connection to the monarch position, it wasn't something looked down on but normalize. As this is a civilization that needed a monarch rule at all times to guide the nation, but it is good to note that it was a typical Western interpretation that this era was prone to burning alive people, when the irony was that the Europeans burning women, being witches, or even more heresy were more burned. Number two, head be gone. The ancient Egyptians set harsh punishments for those accused of treason or corruption. The death penalty was usually applied by impalement, thumping, or a hundredfold fine, and this applied to both men and women. The decree also referred to the death penalty for someone who steals an animal belonging to the temple and transfer it to another party, while confiscating the property of the thief in favor of the stolen temple. The ancient Egyptians distinguished between the stolen goods and the bear the attribute of holiness and considered it a religious crime that requires execution, and those stolen goods that do not affect the sanctities, settling for the penalties of beating, and the fine for the theft 100 times of the value of the stolen items. Number one, buried alive. Of course, all of these leads to death eventually as the punishments were drastic, dangerous, violent, and vile. I mean, if you somehow survived the beheading, then what a miracle that would be, but death was only reserved for the extreme measures of punishment for women of these times. As I mentioned, there was very minimal if not just the common punishment of corporal punishment. The scariest, in my opinion, would be buried alive. In some cases, individuals might be sentenced to be buried alive, although this was likely a very rare extreme form of punishment, most likely only reserved for the ones with extreme cases of crime. It's important to keep in mind that our knowledge of specific cases and punishment in ancient Egypt is limited, as much of what we know is derived from inscriptions, legal texts, and other historical records. Additionally, practices may have varied over time and in different 
different regions of ancient Egypt. The legal systems and punishments evolved over the millennia, so there could be variations in practices depending on the specific period within ancient Egypt history. Violence against women is a human rights violation, potentially touching on the rights to life, to equality, to liberty, and security of persons to equal protection under the law, to be free from all forms of discrimination and violence, to the highest standard attainable of physical and mental health, to just the favorable conditions to work, as well as the rights to not subjected to and cruel, inhumane, degrading treatment. And although the cruelty and damages to women was abhorrent and tragic, it still lingers in our day as now, 60% of women still don't report crimes due to fear of shame and stigma. But we still need to be safe spaces to those who need reassurance so that they can speak up. We still got a lot of work to do, you know? Number 10, Clara and Katerina Mororova. Clara was actually a very loving and acceptable mother to her two sons, Andrej and Jacob, where they would take trips and summer camps and she would play with her sons all the time. It wasn't until a new child entered their home by the name of Annika and Clara and her sister Katerina were part of a cult named the Grail Movement. When Anika came into the picture, it was under the support of Katerina and Clara's sister where she was told by Katerina that Anika was a 13 year old who escaped from a trafficking gang that had physically harmed her. Anika was also apparently very sick and suffered many illnesses which gained Clara's sympathy. Clara wanted to adopt Anika after bonding with her so quickly and even had a mystery doctor tell her how to take care of Anika. This same doctor told Clara that her sons were a problem and needed to be cured from their evil spirits. It was then Clara would do an affluent amount of violence and harmful things to her biological sons like shock therapy, making them eat their own flesh, dunk their heads in water, as well as invite others to her cult to do the same. Anika would also lie to make the aggression towards the boys even worse. It wasn't until a man named Edward had a CCTV camera for his newborn baby when Clara was caught in the act. Clara and her sisters were caught and it turns out Anika was actually a 33 year old woman posing as a 13 year old named Barbara who had a disease that made her look younger than she actually was. She was eventually arrested as well, which if you've seen the movie Orphan, it's actually based where this was from. Clara got 9 years in prison and her sister got 10 years since her sister Katerina actually knew who Barbara was the whole time. Number 9, Cordelia Botkins. However you were in your relationships or affairs, be aware of ex-lovers who might never want to let you go. Cordelia met her lover, a highly regarded reporter, John Preston Dunning, when he was bicycling in San Francisco. At that point, she was 41 years old, 9 years his senior, and although they were already married to their own partners, John was very smitten by Cordelia. John eventually was left by his wife who discovered the infidelity, but for Cordelia, her husband was pretty cool with it. John also had issues with gambling debts and he was let go from his job because he was a heavy drinker. So he had to move in with Botkin's hotel. Their affair lasted for about three years but ended when John was rehired to cover the Spanish-American War. When he left San Fran, he told Cordelia, baby girl, I am not coming back. And he even reconciled with his wife because he was leaving for Cuba where he helped survivors of the Spanish battleships during the Battle of Santiago de Cuba. Cordelia, however, didn't care for this and wanted him back. So she sent anonymous letters to his wife, Elizabeth, detailing her husband's affairs. Unfortunately, it got worse when Elizabeth opened a box of candies addressed to her and her sister with the words, with love to yourself and baby, passionately and fond of candy. Elizabeth and her older sister died from arsenic poisoning and their father was able to decipher their handwriting from the previous letters to Cordelia and Cordelia went to life imprisonment. Number 8, Mary Sue Hubbard. It was always in the 1950s where a lot of crap happened that led us to the chaos we know today. And for Mary Sue Hubbard, she is also known as the wife of the founder of Church of Scientology, Ron Hubbard. She was sentenced in the federal court in the 1980s to four years in sentence prison for her role in the conspiracy to plant church spies in government agencies, steal government documents, and bug at least one government meeting. She told USD District Judge Norma Holloway Johnson that she sincerely and publicly apologized for her actions. Johnson ordered Hubbard, who had been freed pending appeal for her 1979 conviction in the case, to turn herself into the federal officials in three weeks, during the time in three weeks, to begin serving her sentence. Hubbard, who lived in Los Angeles at the time, was the last of 11 church leaders who were indicted in the conspiracy in August 1978 to go to prison. The indictments came after the FBI raided the church headquarters back then in Los Angeles in 1977, and the raids were said to be the largest ever conducted by the FBI at the time. Dr. Documents introduced in courts by prosecutors in 1979 contended the operatives of the church initiated numerous break-ins at government official offices, including the Justice Departments, and they secretly placed a listening device in the Internal Revenue Services conference room, and all in an apparent effort to combat what the church alleged government harassment. Judge Johnston commented that she didn't know whether the government had harassed the church, but she quotes, Even if I assumed there was harassment, I still can't accept what she did as excusable. Number 7, Natalia Guerrera. Speaking of religious cults, Natalia Guerrera was definitely part of one where she had sacrificed her own two-day-old 
infant and burning him to death as part of a satanic ritual. She was finally apprehended by police after evading capture for two years. Just two days after giving birth, Natalia agreed to have a baby, Jesus, quote unquote, killed after the leader of Antares de la Luz cult and the father of the child, Raymond Gustavo Castillo Gaete, declared that the infant to be an antichrist and that the sacrifice would help prevent the end of the world on December 21st, 2012. Natalia had previously stated in her defense that she was drugged at the time of the murder, but a forensic psychologist declared that the numbers were not under the influence when the sacrifice was carried out. After her sentence, Natalia managed to flee and was on the run for two years. Investigators noted that she had lived in different houses and even changed her identity in order to evade capture. The police also noted that after being apprehended, she did not show remorse and claimed that she was manipulated by the cult and was therefore innocent. Number 6, Eileen Warrenos. Eileen Warrenos was a convicted serial killer as she targeted only men as an adult worker. She had up to 7 victims and would target specifically motorists, men who would meet her on the road as she acted as a hitchhiker. She was incarcerated at the Florida Department of Corrections BCI death row for women and she tried to appeal to the US Supreme Court which was later denied. At that point she dismissed her legal counsel and terminated all pending appeals. She then would go off to say in quotes, I killed those men, I robbed them as cold as ice and I'd do it again. There is no chance in keeping me alive or anything because I'll kill again and I hate crawling through my system. I am so sick of hearing this, she's crazy. Stuff. I've been evaluated so many times, I'm competent, sane, and I'm trying to tell the truth. I'm the one who seriously hates human life and would kill again. After extreme mistreatment, she suffered while imprisoned and the inhumane management given to her by the officers. In her final interview, she expressed to the media in quote, You sabotaged me, society, and the cops, and the system. An attacked woman got executed and was used for books and movies and so on. Her final on camera words were, Thanks a lot, society, for railroading my ass. She was later executed by lethal injection. Number five, Patricia Kerwinkle. As of 2022, Patricia Kerwinkle, now 74, was convicted of seven counts of first degree in August 1969 for the Manson family attacks that left seven people dead. She was also known as the Manson Girl when she was arrested in Mobile, Alabama. It was during the summer of 1969 where Charles Manson ordered his members to end the lives of seven people in Los Angeles, including actress Sharon Tate. During the trial, Patricia Charles' attorney, Paul Fitzgerald, suggested that although her fingerprints were found inside the Tate home, she might have been an invited guest or friend. Seemingly unfazed by the possibility of a guilt verdict and a death sentence, Patricia reported spent much of the trial drawing doodles of devils and other satanic figures. All during the trial, she remained loyal to the Mansons and the family. Demonstrated of this unity included walking hand in hand with Atkins and Van Houten, singing songs written by Manson, as well as shaving their heads and carving a giant X on their foreheads. Number 4, Sarah Alderte. Sarah Maria Alderte Villarreal is a Mexican alleged serial killer who was convicted for supposedly heading a drug smuggling and human sacrifice cult with Adolfo Costanzo. The members of the cult dubbed by the media the narco satanist called her the godmother with Costanzo as the godfather. In 1989, the killings grew more frequent and gained attention when American tourist Mark J. Kilroy, a university student of Texas, a University of Texas student on spring break was abducted. Was abducted. Costanzo's Eldrete and the rest of the cult went on the run when detectives discovered their shrine. They found human hair, brains, teeth, and skulls at the site. Eventually, the police found their hideout. Eldrete was convicted of criminal association in 1990 and jailed for six years. In the second trial, she was convicted of several of the killings of the head of the cult headquarters and sentenced to 30 years and in prison. If Alderte is ever released from prison, American authorities plan to prosecute her for the murder of Mark. If Alderte is ever released from prison, American authorities plan to prosecute her for the death of Mark. Number three, Leonardo Cianciulli. Known as the soap maker of Corrigio, Leonardo Cianciulli was a serial killer from Italy. Cianciulli was devastated after learning that her son was going off to prepare for the war in World War II. To keep him safe, Chantrulli offered human sacrifices. She killed three of her neighbors with an axe and made tea cakes out of their remains. Not only would Chantrulli eat these cakes, but she would also serve them to guests and Chantrulli's third victim, Virginia, who was made into both teas and cakes and bars of soap. Once again, this soap was gifted to friends and neighbors and Chantrulli was eventually sentenced to 30 years in prison. Sort of sounds like the femme version of Sweeney Todd, but a Bath and Body Works edition. Number two, Enrica Marta. Often referred to as a vampire owing to the nature of her crime, it is just I generally believe that Marta kidnapped kids off the streets of Barcelona and put them in her work brothel. It's also believed that Marta killed minors and used their blood and remains in various elixirs. She then sold these elixirs to the rich, claiming that they treated dangerous ailments like tuberculosis. Twelve victims have been linked to her, although it's suspected that she killed many more. Although. Some historians defend Marta and argue that her crimes weren't as bad or as many as the traditional story suggests. She was actually detained and jailed in the Renia Amalia prison 
Further investigation revealed more housing in Saint Filio de Yolbergat, property of Marta's family. Here they found remains of children in vases and jars, as well as books of remedies, including a list of rich clients who the police apparently tried to hide from being leaked, including rich politicians, doctors, and businessmen, and bankers. Kind of similar to a case we had in our modern times with a guy whose name rhymes with Lefri Nipson. Although she was arrested, she was never tried since she died in the hands of her prison mates, and companions ended up lynching her. Apparently, some say her wealthy clients hired the prisoners to shut her up. It's very interesting how history repeats itself sometimes, as this was in 1913. Proving to be one of Victorian era's most infamous criminals, Amelia Dare could be one of the most prolific serial killers in human history. Back in Victorian England, she was paid for adopting babies in a practice known as baby farming. Amelia Dyer turned this into her profession and adopted numerous children. She began by keeping them for a time until they passed of a natural cause, but ultimately turned into disposing them shortly after adopting them, thereby keeping the money without having to raise them. One of Dyer's victims was actually fl found floating in the river Thames on March 30th, 1896, leading to her arrest and eventual execution. While six victims have been confirmed, it's believed that Dyer may have killed up to 400 children throughout her life. In one of the most sensational trials of the Victorian period, she was found guilty and later hung. Rule number 10 is going to be follow the moral encyclopedia. For ornery young men and women desperately desiring physical and emotional intimacy, yet having to navigate a dating culture that required them to act a certain way, well, it meant self-help books were all the rage. And women in particular drowned in them, thanks to the fact that these books were often written by hypocritical men and had been used since for medieval time to dictate and instruct women on how to become the perfect submissive little doll. Some examples are Henry Butter's ominously titled Maiden, Prepare to Become a Happy Wife and Mother from 1868, and Hayden Brown's Advice to Single Women from 1899. Perhaps most famously though on advising the morals of young women was the Moral Encyclopedia by Charles Barl, which had been making young women hate themselves since 1861. It was a bestseller of its day thanks to the marketing that only decent and morally driven women would own it. To prove themselves as that woman, Victorian gals flock to the bookstores to absorb some menial patriarchal crap that goes as follows. Read no novels, but let your study be history, geography, biography, and other instructive books. Also, trust no female acquaintance, i.e. make no confidant of anyone, because we don't want you ganging up together. Oh, I mean, possibly breaking your feeble tongues, having a conversation. Oh, and if you get a pimple, expect nobody to ever love you again. To quote, remember that whereas the character of a young lady is considered angelic, and blemish in it would withdraw the respect men have for you. Rule number nine is to follow a handbook of etiquette for ladies. Following on a similar sales tactic of gaslighting, only perfect and honorable women know all the rules of etiquette. Oh, you don't? Oh, well, that's such a shame. Now you lose all your honor. You know, though, I can help you out. It's pretty convenient that right here behind me, I have this book I wrote, and it has all the rules. I mean, I can give it to you so you can restore your honor if you give me like $30. I don't know. So, what's in this immensely popular bestseller from the 1860s that bullies women? Well, I'm so glad you asked. First up, keep that bling to a minimal mamas, as you should never wear mosaic, gold, or paste diamonds. They are representative of a mean ambition to appear what you are not, and most likely what you ought not to wish to be. You got a problem with that? Well, sucks. Pipe down, because it's better to say too little than too much in company. Let your conversation be consistent with your gender and age. Don't forget to never talk about your yourself either, as such discussions cannot be interesting to others, and the probability is that the most patient listener is laying the foundation for some tale to make you appear ridiculous. If you do open your mouth and your choice is to be a dirty joke, girl BFF, because a double entendre is detestable in a woman, especially when perpetrated in the presence of men. No man of taste can respect any woman who's guilty of it. Oh, my personal favorite. Did you break something while a guest in someone else's house? Nah. As a lady, you can't do that. It's not possible. Pretend like nothing ever happened. Don't own up to it and gaslight your host. About another's house, should you break anything, do not appear to notice it. Your hostess, if a lady, would take no notice of the calamity, nor say, as is sometimes done by ill-bred persons, oh, it is of no consequence. Rule number eight is having a dress for all occasions. Should you not, well, that's not proper etiquette. As a middle or upper middle class Victorian woman, your job was to spend your day like a brat stall, changing every few hours. This is because of the strict etiquette of the time, which dictated that certain dresses were for certain activities, which meant you had to plan your errands around your outfit changes that made it possible for you to run your errands. 
Isn't that fun? Women would start with the morning time dress, which was relatively comfortable by Victorian standards. However, for us, it would still feel like wearing an iron reinforced tube sock on our entire body. It was simpler in appearance and designed for only the home. Want to take a stroll in the park? Out of the morning dress and into the walking dress. The skirts are shorter by several inches and didn't have a train, so they weren't dragging a leaf pile behind them as they went. The materials were usually rich in color and patterned to be admired amongst the greenery. When women returned home from their daily walk, they would change into dress number three, or the afternoon dress for receiving visitors or visiting others. The skirts had a longer train and the neckline was usually a little lower. After some visiting time, dress number four gets whipped out for dinner and it was the most formal of all casual dresses. Usually silk, satins, velvets, exactly the type of precious material you wanna spill food on. Ball gowns weren't for regular wear, but they were required for fancy occasions so you had to own them too. Rule number seven is to mourn properly. Another dress dress all women owned was an all black morning dress. They kept these bad boys on lock for whenever someone died, which was arguably something to look forward to in the Victorian era. Thanks to Victoria being the most extraordinary and dramatic woman of all time when her husband, Prince Albert, died in 1861, and she spent a bajillion years dressing like a vampire and wearing black mantillas, it set this bizarre fashion and mourning standard that metamorphosized into literal rules. If one was to ignore these rules, it was seen as incredibly offensive to the deceased. Self-help books dedicated to making men and women better at exerting dramatic woe were pretty common to see on bookstore shelves. So, a mourning rule for women was should her husband die, the widow was expected to mourn for no less than two years, while mourning for parents and offspring only lasted a year. Relatives such as grandparents and siblings would only get six months. They dole it out like family inheritance is a little weird. Queen Victoria had favored black crepe, and it became one of the only fabrics that was permissible for mourning clothing. Luxurious silks and satins weren't permissible, only itchy and abrasive materials that chafed the sadness right into you. Women would often wear merino or cashmere instead. No jewelry or ornamentation was permitted unless it served a functional purpose like a button or a clasp, or unless it was a bunch of the deceased's hair and teeth braided in a pattern together in the jewelry. Don't forget your big black hat and grandma's doily tablecloth you dyed black to throw over your face and body. Enjoy looking like a corpse for two years. Rule number six is to glove up. We love to joke about the whole, oh no, if you show your ankle, you're a Victorian W word. But weirdly, hands were actually way more of an issue you. The ankle thing was just because men were still trying to look up women's skirts, even when they were so long, the ends of them entered a room 15 minutes after the wearer did. Fingers were actually oh, the gasp-worthy thing of the day. It was considered highly inappropriate to walk in public spaces with uncovered hands, and would draw a lot of ill repute to those daring damsels who did. In fact, women's hands were so scandalous, both written and unwritten rules of Victorian etiquette unanimously agreed that if a man and a woman happened to be walking on an unevenly surfaced road, it was the one and only time that he could take her hand if they were unwed. Funny that the only permissible contact between the couple the yet to be engaged is to prevent her needing to be picked up from a Victorian pile of mud sludge. It does not matter where you are headed outside of your home, you must wear gloves, which weren't just a popular fashion accessory, but as stated, social necessity. Like every other item a woman could wear in this era, there were many kinds of gloves based on the occasion. For example, daytime was for short gloves, which usually bore designs, embellishments, whereas in the evening, gloves had feathers, satin ribbons, and other super flammable decorations. Rule number five is the modest dip. Because we're on the topic of acceptable fashions and modesty, a Victorian woman taking a dip at the beach pretty much looked the same as four burly men sitting in an ice fishing hut in Alaska. First of all, this was something only middle and upper middle class people could really do as it required money. You had to rent bathing machines, which looked like outhouses on wheels, but were really covered carriages that drove through the shallow water of the beach. There was a hole in the bottom that the ladies could stick their legs into, or sometimes submerge their whole body, but that was ill-advised. Not because the water was filthy, which it was, and riddled with corpses and poison to boot, but because creeps could come swimming up and see your bare legs. Can't afford the traveling outhouse? Well, no beach for you. Rule number four is wife sales, a real legal way to obtain a divorce in stuffy Christianized England. Divorce was unpopular, detested, and openly deterred in those days. Seeing as you were discouraged from intercourse with your partner, married them when you barely knew them, and could barely spend time alone with one another, it was a pretty popular request. You would have to sit listening to the clock tick and his nose being clogged, but him not blowing it for the 444th night in a row while you disassociate staring into a fireplace. What the hell did people 
people expect, of course you want out. You don't even know his middle name. Attaining a divorce in the early 1900s was an expensive undertaking, however. So those who couldn't afford the legal fees sometimes sold their wives to the highest bidder. It was often done with the full consent of the wife, who was usually bought by her family, a new lover, or a female friend. It was an amicable way to say, this was a mistake, get out of my house, good luck and prosper. Rule number three is no flirting. As stated, you were really not supposed to flirt, and flirting to the Victorians included eye contact, talking to one another, looking at another person, breathing their air, knowing their name. Maybe the last one is dramatic, but you get my point. You wanted someone, you had to wait until you met them four or five times, then you could look at them, run into them a couple more times, then maybe request a dance at a ball, and you get one of those a couple times, then maybe you get a sit down chaperone visit, maybe a walk in the park, and a couple more ball dances. Then you can propose. But even then, a Victorian maiden could not be trusted alone with her fiance, lest her dainty, fluttering hand rest on the arm of her intent and cause an outburst that would inflame the fiance's uncontrollable base lust. Even after progressing through several stages of acceptable dating, aka the ball dancing, talking, walking together at a distance, if a man was invited to the woman's home, their acquaintanceship would still have to be under the watchful eye of a chaperone. Single women were never to indulge in behavior with a man that might lead to being kissed or handled in any way. This included strict inspection rules, because I kid you not, men were encouraged to inspect a woman back then. Like many of the stipulations that that accompany shipping procedures. How romantic. If a man wanted to admire a necklace, the woman would have to remove it, hand it over for inspection. Under no circumstances was the item to be inspected while she wore it. Now I know where that flirting tactic came from because guys, Y'all love that whole jewelry admiring flirt and it isn't subtle. And of course, during the chance encounters in one's club or in the park, staring boldly at someone you knew without acknowledging him or her, known as cutting, was the ultimate display of bad flirting manners in Victorian times. Guess they didn't like them bold back then. Rule number two is coming out. Not like that. Coming out in Victorian times meant a woman was tired of being in her parents' house and if she wanted out of it, it meant she had to go find a semi-tolerable guy whose house she could move into in return for a cool ring on on her left hand. This had to be a whole big announcement because to attend such events that a woman needed to to meet a potential suitor, she required the explicit permission of her mother. Only after stating her intent could the chaperones be organized because she can't go alone. Think of Bridgerton. Rich families might accompany the announcement with a series of parties or even a royal visit. Middle class families might hold a celebratory feast. Lower class families might not formally celebrate the announcement at all. Instead, the young woman just changed her appearance to show availability. This could be putting up her hair, donning a long dress, and accompanying family members to social events like church service, church dinners, festival balls. Coming out was best done during the in-season, a literal term. It meant the four months from April to July where the upper-class families up and down the country would send their teenage daughters to London. After flocking there en masse, the upper classes would congregate a series of balls and dances for the purpose of meeting, matching, and reproducing the next generations. At these events, the race was on to find someone with whom to make love. Again, this phrase of which, whose meaning has changed considerably over time time. Making love in the Victorian age meant seeking out someone who might one day come to love you. This was done by eligible bachelors going up to girls chaperones, giving them a little card, requesting a dance with her. Her dance cards would be stacked in queue order in which the men got their dances and they were only allowed three per woman. End of the night rolls around and our maiden will choose if she liked a suitor and have her chaperone return the card to indicate, oh yeah buddy, it's on. Rule number one is how to travel, aka how not to have fun. Here's your duties when you're traveling as a Victorian lady. Listen up, take notes, dress appropriately. This is usually a dress similar to the morning gown, lighter and easier to move around in, but most importantly, plain and understated with few details. They would accessorize with dark leather gloves, straw bonnet, and of course, a travel corset, which was apparently said to be much less restrictive. Pick your seat carefully. It was customary for a woman traveling alone to choose a seat either next to another woman or an elderly gentleman. Women traveling alone were seen as prime targets for pitpocketers and thieves. It was usually only done to poor women without chaperone options, but all women, richer poor were instructed to keep only a small amount of customary spending cash on their person and give the bulk of their dough to their driver or escort to keep safe. Speak when spoken to, as only men were allowed to spark conversation with a lady, never the opposite way around. Women were expected to respond politely and accept invitations to the refreshment saloon, even if they didn't want to go. That's because of the next rule. Never ever be rude while traveling, especially alone. It was imperative a woman act with the utmost class, even if being accosted by a persistent male passenger. But make sure you don't pester him. If a woman is traveling with a male companion, it's not appropriate to ask him such questions as, when do we get there? How far is it? You know you're making the wrong turn. Yes, you are. I know you are. I've been this way before. Look, that was the wrong way. How much time do you think that wrong turn added? Do you want to stop and grab something to
do, yeah, no, strictly forbidden. Can't do that crap. But don't forget, you're also a babysitter to the because if the lady's male chaperone accidentally wandered into designated female compartments, it was her fault for either inviting him into the quarters or not alerting him of the specialized area. And lastly, while traveling, don't check yourself in. If a journey requires a stop at a hotel along the way, the lady would remain in the carriage while the driver or escort took care of all the room arrangements, likely because it was unheard of for a woman to make such a decision on her own. Punishment number 10 is Ash Bath. Just saying medieval times doesn't actually mean much. Every empire and kingdom had its own respective medieval time. At different times than one another. So, Persia spanned from the 6th century to the 15th century, during which time they concocted some truly heinous punishments for those who did wrong, or at least those who did wrong in the eyes of whatever crazed leader was in charge at the time. Setting the stage for long-suffering death everywhere, Persia introduced such styles as forcing people to drink molten gold, tearing people apart with trees, and drowning them in ash. This punishment was one of the worst deaths you could receive, reserved for the worst criminals and those guilty of high treason or offenses against the gods. And it was horrifying. It consisted of throwing a victim into a 75 foot tower filled with ashes. You'd break a couple of bones, but it was a soft landing. From outside the tower, large hand cranks were spun by a team of men, sending the ashes flying and disrupting the solid pile so that the victim was pushed deeper and deeper down the tower, suffocating on burnt ash until they drowned in it. If you've dipped your toes in the Bible, you may know there's quite a few people that got this sentence in there, such as a corrupt Jewish priest whose family isn't allowed to bury his remains with a bunch of sassy stuff. Snaps added. However, the concubines caught planning coups against their leader on several occasions met this fate too. Punishment number nine is the evil field. So medieval Rome is characterized by the break with Constantinople and the formation of the papal state, with technically ongoing until its collapse, which marks the beginning of Europe's medieval period. On the topic of being buried while still breathing, the Romans also enjoyed dumping people into holes alive in their medieval times. One famous example is the Vestal Virgins, the priestesses of the hearth god as Vesta who were sworn to chastity. However, should they break that chastity vow, they had a special acre of grass dedicated just to burying them alive. Like most deaths, Romans like to make a big show of it, and the Vestal breaking her virginity vow would naturally be the Sunday matinee. They had an entire little ritual. She'd be carried on a litter throughout the city in the nude until they reached the Campus Seculoratus, aka the evil field. There, an underground chamber awaited in which she'd be lowered into and sealed inside alive. There was only one ever known instance in Roman history where a Vestal Virgin wasn't slain for breaking her vows, that would be Julia Achilia Severa, the wife, then ex-wife, then wife again, of Emperor Elagabalus. It's believed that Julia remained with him until they were killed in the year 222, but who's to say they put Julia in the ground after. Punishment number eight is the finger cinch. China's medieval period was between the fall of the Han Dynasty in 220 CE and the fall of the Mongol Dynasty in 1368 CE. Famous in the Chinese feudal dynasty, this form of punishment was specifically made for the woman who did not obey her master's command. Master can be taken literally, should it be a concubine or a servant, but also figuratively like her parents or husband. The offenders have to put their fingers inside a specialized tool which look like interlocking combs. The device would then squeeze the fingertips, causing immense pain and loss of circulation. If the victim faints, ice water would be thrown on her as a wake-up call. The punishment would continue until the victim was deprived of all their strength. The device was prepared in every shape and size to crush the fingers of any female Male, so she may ultimately surrender to male prejudice. Punishment number seven is the four witnesses. The Ottoman Empire was born very, very shortly, around 100 years at most, before the European medieval period started. As stated, it began when Rome broke from Constantinople, and thus it finished alongside the other European nations in the 16th century. How they punish adultery is akin to many cultures. Man cheats, no punishment. Woman cheats, world must be ending. The Ottoman criminal code did not distinguish between fornication and adultery. Xena was the word used for both, and both were unacceptable from a woman of any kind. And when caught in an alleged act of Xena, in order to ensure the women were not wrongfully accused, the accusers required to produce four witnesses of good standing that actually observed the act of intercourse as it was happening. Imagine that, you walk in on your wife in bed with your best friend. So you have to run yelling into the streets for four people to come right now and see them while they're still hurriedly dressing so you have some chance of getting her punished. However, even if you do manage to pull off four witnesses, if the witnesses can't be found at the time of the woman's trial, then the accusing husband will be flogged 80 stripes and ignored. So what I'm hearing is as a cheating wife, 
You could essentially make the little problem go away if these four witnesses were to, I don't know, just casually disappear before the court date. However, on a terrifying note, the husband's second option when calling the four witnesses to his house is taking justice into his own hands. He can actually just kill his wife on the spot and face no punishment, nor require going to court, even if the witnesses didn't see the wife cheating beforehand. Punishment number six is marks and tattoos. European medieval period started with the fall of Rome in 476 AD and extended to roughly 1450. Meanwhile, a fun fact, the America's never experienced a medieval period because a feudal system was never actually established in that hemisphere. In Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter, protagonist Hester Prynne is marked with a red A to see her as an adulterer. This was practiced in a few regions of medieval Europe, such as Spain, France, even Britain. However, it was reserved for working girls and their keepers and continued well out of the medieval period until the Achaean regime. Women who committed the crime of Puritanism were branded with hot iron to show the world World, how frivolous they are. What The working girls received a P on the arm, the booty, or the forehead, which I feel is a bit vindictive and personal. Meanwhile, the keepers were branded with an M, accompanied by a fleur-de-lis. King Charles IV even made them outlaws, stating that may all girls of joy and public women desolate from our court in said time under pain of whip and mark. After the establishment of the New World, which is out of the medieval period, but as stated, the Americas didn't have one, we see branding laws and colonies more akin to Hawthorne's Scarlet Letter. Such as the 1658 Plymouth Law that stated adulterers must mark every garment they own to identify them of their crime. Adulterers seen publicly without their letters were subjected to public whipping and further humiliation. Punishment number five is just gross. The medieval and feudal periods of Japan, they hold hands on this one, stretched from 1185 to 1603 CE and they easily had one of the most disgusting punishments I've heard of for female adultery, suspected or confirmed. It existed from the 12th to the 9th century Japan, however it was more so practiced in remote villages. Villages. A wife accused of adultery was punished by a defacing, and this defacing was done by seed. Exactly the type of seed you're thinking. So I'm going to be talking around the subject due to a graphic nature. If a husband suspected that his wife had been unfaithful, he and his friends would take her to a remote area where she'd be restrained, and the men would take turns standing above her and deface her. When the adultery is suspected but actually caught and confirmed, the adulteress would be led through the village naked before tied up in the center on her knees. Paper screens would be set up around her so that the men in the village who were urged to participate in this horrific act of public shaming may have privacy while they deface her. The screens only protected the men from indecency. The adulteress would remain exposed for the public to see what was happening to her. Punishment number four is working girl. Hard to follow up that last one with anything worse or more gross but the medieval Japan had an eye for an eye judicial system that balanced crime and punishment. Japan had no gender bias and crimes done by women were not punished lightly, the way counterparts in Europe or China would have. Equal punishments were imposed for the same crime no matter the gender. So it's a bit strange that arsonists would be burnt at the stake, thieves have their hands cut off, liars lost their tongues and ears, but women committed a petty crime and was sentenced to work time duration as a working girl, which arguably is not even close to payment in kind. Additionally, a woman could have have her head shaved as punishment for her crime. In larger empires, this was often the punishment for adultery, which is far better off than the one in the villages. The husband would also be granted an automatic divorce from his now bald and weepy ex-wife. Since punishment was equal, a man got his head shaved too, had to repay dowry, and get publicly shamed, right? No, and his wife wasn't allowed to leave him for it either. Punishment number three is scoffism. Back in the medieval Persia, this punishment was death by being eaten alive. It had taken place in a swamp or somewhere where the boats, which would be two canoe-like boats or one hollowed out tree, could lie exposed to the sun. The victim would be tied inside the space with their head, hands, and feet exposed if possible. At which point the victim is force fed honey and milk. This is a messy process. It'll splatter and spill everywhere. However, whatever the victim does swallow, inevitably becomes diarrhea. The idea was that this would attract every insect, vermin, and wild animal in the area. Very soon afterwards, flies and rats, for instance, would show up and start attacking the victim, eating the mixture of milk and honey, but also eating the person alive in the process. Once the diarrhea kicks in, it attracts other animals, especially the rats, who will begin feasting on you as well and sometimes enter you. Death usually came from septic shock or gangrene because the victim would be force-fed this honey and milk every day until they died, meaning dehydration was no issue. Religion 
religious fallacy, coup attempts, and adultery were all punished in this horrific manner, and many women suffered this end. Punishment number two is wooden horse. This device was used in Europe and Japan in the 14th to 18th centuries, making it predominant in medieval Europe. Initially, the horse was used on women accused of heresy and witchcraft. The Spanish particularly loved this crude device, and they invented it. Sometimes they even styled it to look like a horse. Its back was a triangular wedge women were forced to sit on as weights around their ankles dragged them and their rear and hoo-ha area down on the sharpened wedge. It was covered in part one of this video. In Japan, however, they added another particularly horrific element that was not meant to just cause some external tears and pelvic fractures the way the Europeans did, rather cause mass hemorrhaging and death. The concept is the same, wooden horse with a wedge that you'd be forced to straddle while your legs are pulled down. However, the Japanese added an appendage-like structure on the horse's back, which the woman was forced to sit on. The appendage had the appendage was studded with iron nails and could be rotated via a hand crank from beneath. Naturally, this would cause almost immediate heavy bleeding and internal damage before the crank was even turned. Many would die miserably and quickly, whereas the ones who somehow survived often only did with paralysis. This form of punishment was served on basic offenses, such as adultery or unpleasing her husband. Punishment number one is the chest tax. Imagine taxing someone for what's on their chest. Now imagine taxing someone for what's on their chest chest and for them trying to cover it. Over in India, this was a reality imposed by the king of the erstwhile state of Travancore, one of the 550 princely states that existed in British-ruled India. The chest tax was imposed on lower class women if they covered their chest in public and it was to discourage them from doing so. The purpose of this tax was to maintain caste structure, said Dr. Shiva K.M., an associate professor of gender ecology. Social customs on clothing were tailored to a person's caste status, which meant that they could be identified by merely how they dressed. The village legend of Nangali is about a woman who supposedly cut off her girls in an effort to protest against the caste-based chest tax. Nangali belonged to the Abhava caste. Her community was required to pay the tax alongside many other lower castes, but villagers say she decided to protest by covering her chest without paying the chest tax. When the tax inspector heard she was refusing to pay the tax, he went to her house to ask her to stop breaking the law. She still refused and instead cut her girls off her chest in protest instead and presented them to the tax collector in a plantain leaf. According to the local villagers, Nangali died of excessive blood loss while her distraught husband took his life by jumping on her funeral pyre. Her act was selfless and a sacrifice that benefited all the women of Travancore and ultimately forced the king to roll back the chest tax. The chest tax caught wider attention in 2016 when BBC reported Divya Arya reported on a series of paintings by artist Morali T, a far distant relative on the legend of Nangali. He was so moved by the story and the absence of any visual documentation, he decided to paint a likeness of the act she brought upon herself. I did not want it to depict it as a bloody event. Instead, my aim was to glorify her act as an inspiration to humanity, a representation of what would command respect. You're better off without them, apparently. Number 10 in the countdown. The Christian view of women in ancient Roman society came in and, like the religion itself, quashed the pagan beliefs preceding them. Pagan times in Rome weren't a merry old good time for women, don't get me wrong, but they had more rights and respect when there was a whole pantheon of women gods whose tempers were to be revered and feared by every Roman man. But then they convert and answer to one god who was depicted as a soul man, making it, pun intended, a man's world. In the 4th century AD, the Andrew Tate of ancient Rome, Saint Jerome, set the standard on how you should perceive and treat women around you. If your wife has a bad temper, or if she's stupid, or if she has a birthmark, or if she's haughty, or if she has a foul breath, you'll only learn these things after marriage. You always have to tell her how beautiful she looks. If you so much as look at another woman, she feels ridiculous. Rejected. You have to bow down before her and call her my lady, and you mustn't forget her birthday. It's worse if she's pretty than if she's ugly, because then you have to constantly be on your guard. Honestly, try and tell me you can't picture some old Roman bald dude in a toga, like white beard, one of those stupid teak tables, wearing the oversized podcast headphones, saying that exact tirade while like Joe Rogan is sitting across from nodding like, yeah, man, yeah, that's what's up. Hey, dude, kind of makes sense that you're only going to find out about her personality after you married her when y'all don't 
don't even know each other when you get married and you bought her at a bride auction like she's a cow for your farm. So, according to St. Jerome, it was better to be alone with God than in the company of a woman. Guess God is a woman because he was found in bed having an affair with a married one. Oopsies, hypocrite. Do you want to learn more about hypocrisy in the past? Because there's a ton of it. Subscribe to The Hive to see our regularly released history videos. Alrighty, that was a beautiful segue into number nine, the discussion of how women in ancient Rome could be worshipped but never equal. As stated, while Roman society may have been dominated by men, their original godly pantheon was anything but. They bowed to powerful women, begging for mercy or pleasure from their female goddesses. Part of the appeal of Christianity was bowing to a woman no longer. They finally became obsolete, powerless. But they were anything but powerless in the era of Roman paganism. Of the three supreme deities worshipped by ancient Romans, only one, Jupiter, the king of gods, was male. The other two were Juno, the chief goddess and protectress of the empire, and Minerva, Jupiter's daughter, the goddess of wisdom and war. The Vestal Virgins, aka priestesses of Vesta, were ranked among the city's most important residents. Having been appointed to this role before puberty, remaining chaste for the next 30 years of their lives, these six virginal women held sacred duties like preserving the earth, the hearth fire, and Vesta's temple. As it was believed if the fire died, so would Rome. That's a pretty serious job. They also had the most important duties in the kingdom, such as safeguarding the wills of the wealthiest and most prominent Romans, such as Julius Caesar himself, because women were more trustworthy than men, but they weren't to be trusted. Okay, anyway, the priestess's religious significance gave them unusual power and influence, and they occasionally used it as when they intervened to save the young Caesar from the dictator Sulla. This worship of women and deifying them into earthly roles such as the Vestals had been the saving grace of women's rights in the horrifically male-centric Roman society. Unfortunately, as said, it was swept away in the name of man. Okay, a break from sad lady facts for number eight. Let's cover warrior women. Yeah, now that's more like it. So, from the northern most tip of the border with Asia, plenty of ancient European armies were happy to welcome women into their ranks. But historians always agree upon one exception where the army and navy were almost 99.9% .9 men. Can you guess who it is from the title of the video? Women may have been banned legally from joining the army, but your average Roman soldier would have seen their fair share of female combatants, as well as their own women on the home front. Professor Valentin J. Belfiglio shared that Roman women were capable of close combat as well. Not only were they frequent competitors in gladiatorial shows, but they, like the women of the clans fighting against the invading Romans, were known to take up arms in warfare, albeit in a non-official, unsanctioned capacity. History tells of a few of these women, such as Cloelia, who in 506 BCE freed herself and 20 others from the Etruscan camp and swam them home through enemy spears. For her courage, the Romans erected a bronze equestrian statue with the heroine seated upon it. Belficlio notes, on the highest point, along the sacred way. When the Carthinian general Hannibal was invading, women and men inhabitants fought valiantly and they burned his siege engines together. Hannibal would later face and lose to the honored Busa, who aided Roman fugitives from his war regime. So, in summary, women may have been banned legally from joining the army, but your average Roman soldier would have battled against and sometimes besides women despite that. The name game, it's number seven in the countdown. Women, like a lazy boy chair, an ice maker or owning a cat were possessions in ancient Rome. And so, like the college roommate who complained if you move their toaster two inches to the left, they put their name on it. Not in a label maker fashion, more so in a recycle fashion. From the moment of their birth, women were viewed under male authority. Therefore, the name of a baby girl would be close to her father's. For example, Claudius may have a daughter named Claudia. Augustus becomes Augusta. Constantine, Constantina. Okay, so maybe the rule was just whatever the last letter was swap it to an A. Ironically, this is why a lot of women's names end with an uh sound. Talk about making historical waves, seeing as our society still inherently perceives names with that ending as sounding feminine. As the empire grew older, women in the ancient Rome were granted more freedom, often by sheer number of children they bore. Three children could allow a woman to become independent. Independence meant no more naming your kids after their dad, which isn't fair anyways because I'm sorry, but who carried this kid for 12 months and then had to push it out? Thus, daughters started being named after goddesses, their mothers, their aunts, 
and plants. Anyways, number six, once you were old enough for baby time, you were married off. And when that happened, you donned a stola. In my recent video, the top 10 messed up marriage traditions in ancient Rome, I explained the Roman marriage ceremony and also the garb worn. The flamium was an egg yolk yellow veil worn by brides that they would lift from their face and hair in preparations for vows to instead fall down on their shoulders and biceps. This placement of the veil signifies her donning the stola. The stola was a type of long overlay. Sometimes it was in the form of a dress itself, but oftentimes it was an additional soft and light drape of material. It was worn by married and respectable women and was also associated with modesty. For those who could afford it, a stola with decorations around its neckline was available. This trim could be patterns, embroidery, beads, and motifs. When initially introduced, the stola was a preserve for the upper class patrician women in the early republic. But over time, the right and then the absolute expectation to wear it extended to the lower class women. The pala, a rectangular shawl, was also worn over it as a cloak and draped over the left shoulder. Any women who were convicted of adultery or were working girls or actresses were forbidden to wear a stola in public. Part of what dictated the stola, however, was number five, the stupid opium law. So in 215 BC, the Roman men who were overtaxed passed the Opinion Law, named after Gaius Opius, the tribune of the plebeians who instituted it. And it was passed one year after Rome's catastrophic defeat at the hands of the Carthinian general Hannibal. To summarize it in the laziest terms, Opinion Law was initiated by a group of poor people seeking revenge against the wrong source. Instead of trying to coup their government for the taxation, they lashed out at women and their already minimal freedoms. This new Opinion Law limited Roman women's allowance to half an ounce of gold and prohibited them from wearing dresses, multicolored garments, or anything with purple borders as purple dye was very expensive. It also prohibited women from riding in a carriage except on a long journey, pregnant or otherwise. Yes. 20 years after it's imposed, Marcus Fundanius and Lucius Valerius, the tribunes of the people, brought a motion to repeal the Opinion Law. Noblemen came forward hoping to persuade or dissuade them. A crowd of both supporters and opponents filled the Capitoline Hill. The matrons and maids of Rome, whom neither counsel, shame, husband, and father's orders could keep them at home, proceeded to blockade every street in the city and every entrance to the forum. As the men opposed and came down to the forum, the women tried to reason with them to let them too have back the luxuries they had enjoyed before. The Republic was thriving and that everyone's private wealth has increased with every day. When the speeches for and against the law had been made, even more women poured into the public the next day when the vote was to be cast. Together, they besieged the door of the Brutuses, who were vetoing the decision to repeal the law, and they didn't stop until the tribunes changed their minds. The women of Rome, as a collective, forced the men to repeal their biased law. Number four is a bit of a strange one. It's what's best. Wealthy Roman women didn't believe in breastfeeding their own children. Instead, they handed them over to a wet nurse, usually a prisoner or a hired free woman who was contracted to provide the service. Soranus, the influential author of a second century work on gynecology, prescribed that a wet nurse's milk might be preferable in the days after birth, on the grounds that the mother could become too exhausted to feed. He did not approve of feeding on demand and recommended that solids such as bread soaked in grape juice should be introduced at six months. Soranus also pointed to the possible benefits of employing Greek wet nurses who could pass on the gift of her mother's tongue to her charge. Did he think that she would be able to give language through breast milk? You know what? Never mind. This flew in the face of advice from most Roman physicians and philosophers who always suggested that mother's milk was the best for both the child and the mother's health and moral character on the grounds that wet nurses may pass on, not kidding, their crappy flaws or personality to the baby. These same men also usually pitched that women who did not feed their own child were lazy, vain, and unnatural and only cared about possible damages to their figures. The hatred of women was very real. Alright, well, let's get away from the terrible medical beliefs of ancient men, number three will be the OG hair extensions. Historical evidence from Pompeii suggests hairdressing shops, known as torresos, existed. It makes sense. Roman women did have certain hairstyles expected of them based off class or marital status. E.g., unmarried women put their hair up in woolen bands when going out and added a gauzy hair veil to boot. While single women were expected to have their hair up, it doesn't mean it couldn't be styled. They pepper in braids, twists, and curls. More noble or prestigious 
religious women could arrange their hair more elaborately in various styles such as long curls and waves. The curls would be made by dipping tongs in fire. Cool, right? But one specifically weird little tidbit is that brunette ginger and raven hair Roman women had a fixation with blonde hair. This interest was caused when Roman warriors brought back captured women from France and Germany and quickly became incorporated into the imagery of their gods and goddesses, who oftentimes had dark hair or the more heavenly and revered color of ginger before this point. The Roman ladies would dye their hair blonde with pastes and powders in order to copy the blonde hair of their working girls and captives, but the color would eventually come off as they hadn't figured out the chemical composition to permanently bleach hair yet. To solve this vanity issue, the hair of the blonde working and captive girls was chopped off so Roman women could wear it as wigs. Might as well make number two all about the Roman face mask then. Why? Because it was gross. Just so gross. Y'all ready? Homegirls back in the day made face masks composed of sheep's wool soaked in a soupy paste mixture of animal placenta, excrement, and urine, as well as sulfur, abrasive oyster shells, and bile. Who's bile? God, okay. And this is before you'd whiten your skin. Another trend started by the arrival of the pale French and German captive girls. They did this with lead, dung, and whatever marl is. Want to reduce wrinkles? Get out of Canada or anywhere under the crown because the Roman women would kill swans, which is a crime under British rule, and use their fat. This was all part of Mundus Mulibris, which translated it means women's world, a reference to women's fineries in the ancient Roman world. This would include face and skin care, but also dresses, jewelry, hair care, all described in Latin literature by the famed Cicero, who noted it alongside Mundi Omatam, aka the ordered beauty of the world, and Kale Omatas, celestial adornment. See, there's some non-deprecating writing on Roman ladies. Good job making it over to the very low bar there, Cicero. Seneca, not so much. The depressing dude was quick to blasphemize makeup and say it led to the decline of Rome. And of course, for number one, we will visit Sappho on Lesbos Island. The Greek poet Sappho, who lived from six 30 to 570 BCE lived on the island of Lesbos just off the west coast of what is now Turkey and composed poems that live on in infamy to this day. As she speaks very openly about her homoerotic attraction and even implied intercourse amongst women. These poems are mostly written from the perspective of herself as a character. But what did the Greeks and Romans think of this? How could these poems be so widely adored that they're remembered to this date? So. Like I've mentioned, men wrote Roman history, so they weren't particularly interested in what women got up to when men weren't around. As a result, we know little about same gender relations of women in Rome, but what we do know is telling. The Greeks and the Romans as a society, of course, recognize that some people are more interested in one gender over another, but the general consensus was not to assume this preference was a fixed aspect of a person's identity. Instead of thinking about gendered attraction in terms of genders a person was attracted to, the Greeks and Romans cared about the role of person took during the act of intercourse with an individual. For some Romans, a same gender relationship between women was the most confusing thing imaginable, as well as a little bit disturbing. They had trouble comprehending the possibilities of the relationship given that neither of those involved a man and could naturally take the male role. Layman's terms, these empires believed the act of intercourse was a free adult man proving his masculinity by dominating the territory of an inferior person. If there was no man involved, then there was no real intercourse happening. Therefore for women having relations, let alone extramarital affairs with one another, wasn't something men needed to worry about. So in at number 10, we have witch marking. I'm trying to avoid some things we've already covered in similar videos, so while we've discussed witches, let's talk about witch marks. So during the English and Scottish witch hunt days, there was a belief that witches always had a natural skin mark. This could be a mole or a scar or a pock mark or even a really bad zit. So when they came across a woman whom they thought were a witch, but she didn't have any of those markers, that was the end of it, right? She isn't a witch? Well, no, they gave her a skin mark and instead, specifically by using a pricking needle which the witch hunters would carry. These needles repeatedly pricked the flesh of the accused until it produced the result that wouldn't bleed but was insensitive to pain, which fulfilled the criteria of a witch's mark. It's a subtle punishment for something that they were yet to be accused of because by giving them the mark they could now accuse them. These witch hunt days were a whole mess. Number 9 is marking your territory. Not in a cool sexy I got a tattoo 
new way, more in a scarlet letter kind of way. As you'll learn in this video, a woman who cheated or even was single and just engaged in intercourse of her own free will could be classified as a sinful adulterer and cheater and be punished, usually a lot worse than a man. So when Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote The Scarlet Letter, he took inspiration from real life events. The letter, which for the character Hester Prynne was just a red A, was usually the letters AD, which stands for adultery, as outlined by the Plymouth Colony Law in 1658. Multiple accounts across Europe verify that someone who has been marked was to be seen out in public without it, could be subject to public whipping and other public humiliations that ensured a person's social alienation. Like in the Scarlet Letter, when Puritan minister Arthur refuses to admit his sinful side of the act with Hester, he's branded with an A in his chest. In a man's case, while this was of course painful, it was allowed to be hidden. He also didn't have to face the societal consequences the way any woman would have. For number 8 we travel to discuss status degradation. While it still persists today, not everyone knows what it means. So essentially you do something wrong, oopsies, you lose some of your basic human rights. You could steal something, have relations out of wedlock, cheat on your partner, miss some work. Every empire that has used this tactic has had a variety of ways that you could mess up and receive this punishment. Naturally, in times where a woman was property and couldn't buy things, own things, or do things, or breathe without having a man side eye her for it, this was a monumental punishment to receive. Under the Roman Empire, Augustus, who reigned from 27 BCE to 14 CE, a woman guilty of adultery could lose several rights as a citizen and suffer a financial burden. Noble women in the Kingdom of Korea during the Chosan Dynasty faced a similar degradation of their societal status if they were found guilty of remarrying as a widow. This intentionally made it hard for Korean women to remarry as they would have nothing to offer a new husband, no inherited lands or funds, and a societal belief deemed her as used goods. Even the descendants of widows of the time who had remarried faced status degradation. They were barred from ever holding office. Adulteresses in the Chosan were stripped of many of their rights and privileges once they were demoted to low born statuses. As serious as these punishments may seem, some high status women who committed adultery in the Chosan dynasty faced an even graver punishment, which was death. So why take someone's status from them as a criminal punishment? Well, because aside from the fact as a woman you'd essentially be left jobless, homeless, and without any family, it's because of a cheater's fama, number seven. While fama is a Latin term for reputation and good name, every country had its own version of this fama. And if you cheated or were even just accused of cheating in 13th century France, which by the way happened a lot because husbands just want to get rid of their wives, the woman was always the center of the punishment, even if that was the man who had been cheating. This is because the status is all a woman ever had for a very long time, and the name of her family's reputation laid on her shoulders. Thus, all that pressure to be religious, virtuous, and most importantly, a submissive woman. The customary laws of Agen province list public humiliation for both the wife and her lover as the appropriate punishment for adultery. If the man could escape before or even after arrest, he could get off without any punishment and his partner had to face her punishment alone. The woman got no such reprieve, even if she was just the mistress he cheated on his own wife with. In fact, if she tried to escape arrest, it warranted death sentence. Women whose fama suffered through public shaming walk of atonement were no longer deemed honorable members of society, and seeing as damning of individuals before law at the time was often based on their reputations, what others thought of them, and how they behaved in public, she'd be left, as I said, homeless, familyless, and dejected. For my Game of Thrones people, think Cersei. Number six is no protection. Get your mind out of the gutter. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, there's no protection from capital punishment. While civil laws were easier to work around by just getting married alone, you can borrow money or property, you can buy things that you couldn't before and sign contracts, the criminal law didn't bend to a married woman, as she faced the same penalties as an unmarried one. Now, there are technically one exception, pregnancy, but only because it could potentially be a boy, which is insane. Additionally, all women were exempt from certain torts, such as the breaking wheel. But man, when a woman got capital punishment, it was the one and only form, and it was the most brutal and painful one, burning at the stake. By the way, they claim this was the only and the necessary option of execution for a woman, as it's a preservation of female modesty. Apparently, other forms of execution were unbecoming of a woman. Although there may be some truth to this wild justification, modern historians have rounded it down to just misogyny, as well as a deep-rooted suspicion and dislike of women as the root of this execution decision. Essentially, when given the opportunity to punish a woman, men went ham for it and wanted to see her suffer as much as possible. So women experienced the worst executions of the Dark Ages. Number five is why women want to stay in religious favor. In medieval Europe, a device was literally invented for women who defied their religious beliefs. Pyramid shaped
shaped and made of wood. The woman who dared to defy her god should fear this. See, they would bind the woman's hands and ankles and then sit one of her two genital openings on the peak of the pyramid. She would then be incapable of shifting her weight anywhere else and was forced to put her weight down on the tip. It would slowly slide upwards and inwards and the longer she was pressed down on it, the more her body split apart. These women would be left for days on end sometimes on this device. The device's slow agonizing death can be compared only to the shame it inflicted as well. The woman was stripped nude and forced to suffer this torture in public for all to see. Number 4 is harems. To start, the word harem is derived from the Arabic word harim, and it often means sacred, forbidden, and sometimes sanctuary. This was an accurate name for, as only women's household members and some related male members were allowed to enter a harem, which was an honored women's space. The harem was the ultimate symbol of a sultan's power. His ownership of women, mostly slaves, was a sign of wealth, power, and sexual prowess. The seclusion from public gaze also inflated this power more so. But a royal harem could be a place of filth and stink where chaos and emotions ran high. This was the price of being property. Used by the emperors and his sons, you could either be favored or so hated that one day you vanish and rumors of your exile whirl amongst your peers. These ladies usually did not have the liberty to move out of the harem as they liked, but inside the harem they could move around as they pleased. There was no sisterhood in them either. Socializing amongst themselves was usually not friendly and jealousies were shown directly. Makes sense, as status and position of authority in the harem were determined by the place that they had in the emperor's favor, and to give the king his first male child was a great competition in this regard, resulted in unpleasantness through the royal harem. Everyone tried their best to please the emperor and turned her bad qualities like jealousy, aggression, or short tempered attitude onto other women. Seeing as many of these women were stolen from outside the empire, let alone inside, frustration with language barrier and culture clash was also a huge source of contempt. Sometimes the women would lie to the sultan to have others disposed of, or they'd simply gang up on one another. Regardless, harems were places of drama, inequality, and a race to be favored as a ticket out of sexual servitude. Hidden sexuality is number three. There were plenty of mainstream laws in medieval and middle Europe against male homosexuality, and while it wasn't considered as serious, lesbianism still posed a threat to the ideals of a male-centric societal order. A law written in 1260 France stated that women caught engaging in homosexuality shall undergo mutilation on her first and second offense, and on her third, she must be burned. This is one of the only laws to specify consequences for lesbianism, but the 13th century and Christian perspective of sex radicalized further into modesty. Lesbianism was equated to sodomy at that time point and therefore carried a similar sentence death. There is sufficient evidence of lesbians in middle ages, most of which come from the church. Turns out many nuns were sexually active lesbians and the church directly acknowledges their presence by having to pass laws, establishing penalties for nuns caught having sexual relations with each other. So not only were they having sexual relations with each other, but it was enough that the church had to do something about it. For example, during the 8th century, Pope Gregory III gave penances of 160 days for unnatural female acts. Still, no torture or death though. This is because as long as phallus or other phallus shaped objects weren't used or involved, the relationship wasn't considered real intercourse. Real intercourse involved procreation after all. So eventually, when Christianity upped the ante, however, any sexual act that caused pleasure, which now included lesbian in intercourse or plain old self stimulation, was now considered sin. So, like most women of the Middle Ages, even bisexual and lesbian women had to settle down for a man at that point. Anyone who struggled with sexuality can imagine how dreadful it would be to live that way. Divorce was a nightmare, which is why it's number two in our countdown. Laws worldwide were unforgiving of divorces, literally always to the woman. In Chinese laws, a woman could only divorce her husband if he mistreated her family, not even her. He, on the other hand, could divorce her for anything. Some accepted grants for divorce were failure to bear a son, evidence of being unfaithful, lack of piety to the husband's parents, theft, suffering a virulent or infectious disease, jealousy, and talking too much. A pretty superficial list, but in Chinese society, Society, divorce was a serious action with social repercussions for both parties, so consequently divorces were not as common as they may sound. She could not be divorced if she had no family to return to or if she had gone through the three year mourning period for her husband's dead parents. And speaking of family, during the Han Dynasty, unmarried women brought a special tax on their family and women with babies were given a three year exemption from the tax.
contracts and their husbands a one year, so there was a huge push to get married. Meanwhile in medieval England, their similarities are stark. They too had a small number of divorces despite an expansive list of reasons to do so, such as there was a discovered blood relation between the individuals, or impotence, or fear used to obtain consent, the marriages entered into under false pretenses, things like that. In many of these cases, the lack of sufficient evidence made them difficult to prove and thus deterred people from taking their cases to court. And number one is the tradition of foot binding. It existed for around 10 centuries, and there are women alive today who still have feet that are the result of feet binding. Foot binding involves systematically breaking the feet and shaping them inwards. This tradition started in the Five Dynasties Ten States period of the 10th century, when beloved concubine of the emperor built a gilded lotus flower stage and performed a dance on bound hoof shaped feet. Being a beloved concubine, the other concubines of the emperor attempted to imitate her feet to curry his favor. So foot binding began within the royal court and spread through China as the next fashion fad. It's done in a ritualistic ceremony accompanied by a variety of traditions to ward off any bad luck. They began by tucking the toes under the feet and using a long, tight ribbon wrapped up to the ankle to hold it all in place. Anytime the foot grew, they broke it inwards more, a process usually taking two to three years. The foot would remain bound for the rest of a woman's life. There is a whole list of issues this caused. Outside of extreme agony and being a handicap, it caused some women pain for the rest of their life. Their walk was changed, as was their posture, and the idealism of a slim body to lighten the pressure on one's feet was all the rage. The binding of feet actually caused the women to develop strong muscles in their hips, thighs, and buttocks, so much that the characteristics were considered physically attractive to Chinese men of the area, aka the girlies were thick. When colonization came to China, western women boycotted foot binding, going as far as to catch women with bound feet and cut off their bindings, a humiliation because these women would never ever show their bare feet to anyone, let alone even husbands. And many of these women lost their husbands when the western boycott worked. A lot of girls who had had their feet bound in order to become marriageable, suddenly found themselves abandoned by their husbands because foot binding was no longer fashionable at all. In at number 10 is jewelry making. Egyptians saw deep spiritual significance in their jewelry, but also had a love of aesthetics. And those two things combined to create some of the most unique and lavish jewelry found in history. Worn to ward off spirits, protect health, bring good luck, and more, there were even certain colors and designs that were associated to certain gods and powers. And so Egyptian jewelers followed very strict rules regarding the mystical aspects of their jewelry creations. While a woman usually would not be a metal worker in Egyptian society, it was very common for her to be making jewelry. The tools were smaller and the process required less heat and thus less danger for her. Metal work techniques included precious metal sheets that were cut and shaped, notched together. Wire work was accomplished through strip twisting. Pieces could be held together with this wire stripping system or crimping techniques. These strips were also how link chains were accomplished as well as the securing of beads or the backs of earrings. And for jewelry designed exclusively for burial, the metal was often quite thin, as the jewelry of the deceased was not subjected to the wares of everyday life. Precious stones, ivory, real flowers, and shells were all common ornaments, as was name engravements, but it was more common with royalty. Jewelry makers were women of high status due to these contributions and the revelry jewelry held in ancient Egypt. For number nine, it's house vendors. Recognized as an ancient heritage profession, and was at its most popular during time periods of ancient Egypt where women were restricted from going out when married. These vendors would roam neighborhoods with buckets and baskets of product for sale. Clothing, perfume, fabric, snacks. Now what was unusual is that the vendor was more often women than men. Walking the streets alone, making these sales because many married women weren't allowed to go out walking the streets alone to make sales. You see the irony. Anyways, this profession found great popularity in single women, and many also were called upon to act as nurses in homes of the wealthy when needed. The career is named Al Dalala, but the idea itself has long been extinct with the freedom for Egyptian women to roam commercial districts. Number eight is being a dancer. Ancient Egyptians loved their music and dance. They were celebratory, but also ritualistic at times. Farmers would dance to thank the gods for a good harvest. Dance groups would perform at banquets. People would go 
go dance around the Nile in the lush season. The list goes on. Many men and women chose dance as a career, and it was a highly respected one. Dancing was considered an acceptable and normal part of life and even important to it. Most festivals were incomplete without it. In fact, dancing was such a revered career that dancers could start as a peasant and become a high status person from it. Just like being a celebrity in the way that people would go to see them perform. Women at the time were even more revered for their grace, elegance, and acrobatics. This career had seven types of dance. Gymnastic, movement, pair dancing, imitative dance, which was like acting like animals, group dances, like a historic cheerleading squad, dramatic dance was female exclusive and rested in illustration, war dances, grotesque dance, and then religious chant dances at temples, and lyrical dance, which was usually a depiction of lovers. Wig makers are number seven. Egyptians loved wigs for a reason that surprises many. It helped keep their heads cool. I mean, it also helped with hygiene and scalp pests and looking pretty, but the heat thing is what really gets folks. Many Egyptians had shaved or cropped hair, and the mesh-like base of a wig versus a headscarf allowed the body heat to still escape. And as said, wigs were also a great shield from lice or other invasive bugs. The hair used in the construction of wigs and hair extensions was always human and was either an individual's own hair or had been traded or bought. Hair itself was a valuable commodity ranked alongside gold and incense in a count list from the town of Cahoon, which puts emphasis on the popularity of wigs. When hair was collected for a wig, it was thoroughly combed and then sorted into lengths individually. The Egyptians invented a variety of hairdressing tools and the wig makers would take the time to braid or coil the hair depending on the wig style, coating each with warm beeswax and resin fixatives so that it would harden when cooled. The job itself isn't unusual, more so the booming industry it had. Wigs weren't worn to this extent anywhere else at the time, and while yes, they were functional against the sun, they were more so aesthetic than anything. Individual braid and extensions could also be attached to someone's scalp for aesthetics, the way that box braids, twists, faux locks, and many other ethnic hairstyles are accomplished today. Wigs were made in a type of factory setting. Archaeologists have uncovered the remain of wig factories, wig boxes have been found in tombs, and multiple mummies have been found with wigs or braided in extensions. Number six, we meet our ladies of the night. Unlike most ancient and even modern civilizations, selling intercourse is illegal or was highly governed. In ancient Egypt, this wasn't even close to the case, but rather the opposite in a peculiar way. Women who worked in the sexual industries were considered divine and respectable, as their career was considered to please the gods. They earned high status and lived in luxury. Working freely and openly, these ladies adorned themselves with red lipstick and eye makeup that differentiated themselves from other women. They were also tattooed, diamond-shaped dots along the thighs and on the fingers or images of the god Bess. When the French invaded, they brought STIs, and they spread rapidly through the brothels, and this prompted the French authorities to introduce a law forbidding French troops from entering the brothels or having these ladies in their rooms. Guess those ladies were hard to resist because anyone who offended the law received death penalty. Number five are the wet nurses. Wet nurses are found in all statuses and were for all statuses. One common denominator though is that the career kind of really sucked, pun intended. So first their social status was always determined by the status of who they were breastfeeding. Royal family, congrats on your special privileges, statues, private quarters, and your own tomb in the family pyramid. Also, her family would receive special perks as an extension of her. Now, royal families only wanted high status wet nurses, and while it's not clear how they were chosen, evidence suggests some kind of blood tie or faint familiar relation. Most wet nurses were from marginalized families in lower socioeconomic statuses and worked under conditions and pre-definitive wages. Wet nurse requirements for any status were intense. She'd have to have given birth at least twice, have a large but healthy body due to the belief that large bodies were more nourishing. Despite that, her breasts should be medium. Too small, not enough food. Too big, the baby's spoiled. In addition to all of these prerequisites, the wet nurse should be sweet-tempered, affectionate, and responsive to her charge. She should also abstain from intercourse because it could reduce her affection towards a child, and they also said no alcohol. A good call, knowing what we know now. Wet nurses were women exploited for the products of their bodies. As slaves, they were coerced for their milk. As lower social status women, they were employed for their bodies to enhance their inadequate domestic status. Even her own household suffered physically and monetarily if a wet nurse defaulted or failed a contract. On the same page, surrogates are number four. This is a widespread practice in Egypt. The first story of surrogacy found in Genesis 16 of the Bible was the story of infertile Sarah having Egyptian Hagar carry her child for her and her husband Abraham. Even Egyptian pharaohs had used concubines to produce heirs. They often married their sisters or aunts, and children born of these marriages were most of the time not in great or functional health and would 
couldn't survive. Any child born of a concubine for a pharaoh was accepted as his lawful offspring. Now, they were quite limited in their rights and they could only inherit the throne in case of the absence of another more entitled heir. Surrogates experienced similar contracts and status leveling as wet nurses. They were desired to be mothers already, have a bigger, healthier body, and naturally beauty was a desired element as well. Women of low status who made a career of surrogacy often died in childbirth or from hemorrhages due to the repetitive birthing process, but for some, it was the only career they could have. Priestress is number three, and so while it was a male-dominated field, many women were employed as a priestress or a high priestress at the temples around Egypt. Mostly from upper status, many were married to the priests, which they owed their position in society. Despite this, they played roles in the temple rituals, such as servicing goddesses Hathor, Neith, and Paket, or working as dancers, musicians, singers, and acrobats in the temple. The most important priestress was known as the god's wife Amun. This woman was usually the daughter of the pharaoh or sometimes his wife. She usually held a very high position in court and performed important rituals to honor the god Amun. The priestress was in charge of managing the gods' affairs, attending to ritual dances and performances, shaking their rattles and rattling their necklaces, which were long and heavily beaded objects. By the beginning of the New Kingdom in 1550, the title Chantress of Amun was used, and it was usually the wives of the priests who gained these elevated positions as well. The concept of a woman as a priest was unheard of in many kingdoms. A high priestress and the reverence and traditions of female gods being led by women were unusual to outsiders of Egypt who oftentimes restricted most priestly activities to just men. Number two is professional mourners. Okay, so here's a weird one. Professional or paid mourning is an occupation not only found in Egypt, but in China, the Mediterranean, and Eastern Europe. This practice is literally paying a stranger to attend a funeral to lament, deliver a eulogy, help comfort the family, entertain, or lay on the ground wailing. There's some range here depends on what kind of funeral you want to have. These paid mourners made ostentatious displays, messy hair and smudged makeup, wailing, pounding on the ground or their chest, throwing themselves about as they smear dirt and sand all over their body while they screamed. It's a full spectacle. Now, another depiction of the paid mourners in Egypt is a little more chill. Two women impersonating the goddesses Isis and Nephthys. They were believed to play a special role in someone's death. Most inscriptions of a funeral where they are present as paid mourners they are on each side of the corpse and their bodies are fully shaved. These women also had to be childless and have a tattoo of either Isis or Nepsi's name on their shoulder. Most evidence of professional mourning is seen in pyramids and tomb inscriptions, such as women holding their bodies dramatically in sorrow, braced over a casket with tears flowing. If you were a theater kid, this was definitely the type of job for you. And number one, it's the female physician. Egypt is a difficult one with historians. There's been a lot of largely ignored discoveries due to the opinions of the those who found them. The evidence of women in ancient Egyptian medical fields is part of that because as it turns out, their physicians were actually primarily women. Evidence shows women in the medical profession going back into early dynastic period Egypt when Marit Ptah was the royal court's chief physician in 2700 BCE. She was the first female doctor known in world history, but there is another unnamed female physician who is listed to be the head of the Temple Neith Medical School in 3000 BCE, so maybe not. Not. But either way, the first female doctor was in ancient Egypt. Women were highly respected throughout Egypt's history and many of their goddesses represented facets of health. Neith has been associated with the invention of birth and Hathor represents fertility. Four deities associated with healing are Heka, Sekhmet, Serket and Nephritim, which are all female. So, bizarre claims you may have heard that no women are involved in Egyptian medicine don't accord with the values of their civilization, which were incredibly equitable. By this reasoning, there were no women involved in anything of no anywhere in the world until the modern era, because history books make no mention of their contributions. But it's all up to say. Number 10, the pillory. Known sometimes as the Thu, this was a form of stocks that was used for women. Men weren't the only ones who were condemned to the stocks back in the day. While on paper, standing around in the stocks for a few hours doesn't actually sound that bad. Like a bit humiliating and a bit exhausting because you gotta keep your arms up here. But you know, that's about it. In reality, it could actually be very dangerous depending on the crowd's temperaments and the accused's reputation amongst the common folk that had gathered. In some cases, people were badly injured, maimed, blinded, and some actually 
died as a result of being tormented by those who gathered while they were in the stocks after suffering great injuries. The unfortunate thing was that you often wouldn't be able to defend yourself because your hands are like restrained. You couldn't move your head and often your hands are just completely restricted depending on the type of stocks that you're being held in. At least with the Thu version, your hands were not restricted because you were like kind of in a collar on a chain. But women also were put in the pillory too, where your hands are restricted, preventing you from defending yourself at all from assailants unless you were being defended by like, I don't know, guards perhaps. Even then, you're probably still gonna be brutalized in some way. Guards aren't there to like, you know, make sure that you don't get to feel the punishment. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Bumblebee and you love when we tell you about some honestly very shocking things that happened in history, be sure to click that subscribe button for even more historical and horrific content. <laughs> Number nine, Drunkard's Cloak. While more popular in the 17th and 18th century, there is still documentation of the Drunkard's Cloak being used into the mid 19th century. It was a punishment given to both men and women, usually those who had you know, a bit too much to drink. However, the punishment was also administered to women who were considered to be promiscuous, like so many of the things that are on this list. If you were sentenced to the Drunkard's Cloak, you'd basically be made to walk around town in like an upside down, heavy and cumbersome bear with holes cut out for your head and your hands. Honestly, this is one of the least awful ones on the list. It's at least you're just in a barrel. <laughs> it doesn't sound like it would be fun, but it doesn't sound like it would be like the worst. I feel like I could walk around for a few hours with a barrel on and I'd be all right. Number eight, Shrew's Fiddle. I have a question. Why are there so many devices that were created in the Middle Ages hundreds of years ago that were still used up until the early 1800s and beyond? That seems insane to me. The Shrew's Fiddle is one of those instruments, but despite being named after a musical instrument, it is instead an instrument of torment. It was used to punish women who were deemed too shrewish and in some places in the world, it wasn't just used on women. The woman in question would be forced to put her neck through a large hole with her wrist being held in the smaller holes so her hands were basically up in front of her but were immobilized. Number seven, Scold's Bridle. Despite the fact that this device can be traced back to the 1500s, there are also records of it being used as late as the early 1800s into the 19th century, which is honestly crazy to me. Like I can't even imagine someone trying to silence me with this device today. Goodness, horrific and humiliating. The Scold's Bridle was used to silence women who were being too loud, either speaking their mind too much, being caught gossiping, or just literally, you know, being too loud. Pretty wild when you think the same society that decided this was a good punishment is also kind of the same society that encouraged women to gossip by pitting them against one another and also, you know, silencing them. So that probably many women felt the only way they might be able to safely speak their minds about something was, you know, like whisper behind someone's back for fear of them hearing and what would happen then. But then of course, if you do get heard, this is what you get. Cause people are like, we don't want you to whisper. We just want you to shut up. Seems like a weird cycle though to me. It's like we created the problem and then we just basically punished people for the problem we created. The Scold's Bridal was a mask that women were forced to wear. Oftentimes it was made to look demonic or ugly in terms of the features on the mask. And it had a painful restricting metal gag inside that would literally hold down the wearer's tongue so they couldn't physically speak sounds terrible. Also then if you try to speak, it could like hurt your tongue, not, not good. Number six, left to cook. While sitting by the fireplace is usually seen as being a pleasant way to pass the time relaxing and soothing. In fact, I was just listening to some fireplace sounds while I was writing today. It becomes a lot less nice and tranquil if you are literally chained to the spot. While the scold's bridal is admittedly awful, it could actually get worse for women confined by the mask. In addition to that punishment, sometimes they would also be chained to the fireplace probably by their parents or guardian or their husband, whoever basically would have owned them at that time until such a time as it was deemed they had learned their lesson. I personally, I like to sit by the fireplace, but I like to do it by choice. Number five, walk of shame. Remember in Game of Thrones when Cersei Lannister was made to do like the walk of shame? Yeah, that is a real thing that happened to women in history. The Scold's Bridal was also sometimes made to be worn by women who were then paraded through the town and in said mask just to humiliate them further. And there's a few different things people would parade people in town with, but the mask is one of them. As, no, as if just being forced to wear that mask wasn't awful enough. I don't think you need to parade someone around or chain them to a fireplace. I think you can just like leave it at the mask, to be honest. Your point would be made. In fact, I don't even think 
think you need the mask at all. Just don't try to make a point to begin with and then we're all good. How about instead we just let women exist and be heard? Hmm? Just a thought from a woman who's living in 2023, ye old past. Talking to you, past, back there. Yikes. Number four, hand clamps. Honestly, this sounds like one of the most horrific and worst things I've heard of. It might not sound bad to people, but I don't know. I just imagined what this would be like, and I was like, that's horrifying. This method of torment was popular during the feudal period of China. It was used all the way up till the 19th century. What did it involve? Forcing women to put their hands into a tool that would then squeeze the tip of their finger. Doesn't sound that bad when you're thinking of it on like the surface level, but, and in terms of like the surface area of your finger, but this pain was was actually so bad because of the pressure that it would cause many to just pass out. But once you passed out, they would just splash some cold water on you and force you to stay awake so you could experience every single second of pain awake. It wasn't reserved for just the hands or fingers either. There were also tools like this used to apply pressure to the feet and the head even of suspected offenders. Yeah, this method of course wasn't even safe for people who were convicted of adultery, which honestly I don't even think you should torment people physically like this anyways, or mentally, even if they're guilty of it, like let's just be adults and move on. It was used on both guilty and innocent folks. I am sure, I am 100% positive. All you had to do was be suspected of adultery for this brutal form of punishment to be administered. So you don't even need any, I mean, back then, I don't even think people had proof. They were just like, I have a feeling, so. Do something terrible to this woman. Number three, ducking stool. Despite being more well known for its use during witch trials, the ducking stool was also something that was used to torment women in the 19th century as well. In fact, documentation of its use exists from as late as 1896. That seems pretty late to me. That's wild. Although I obviously wasn't alive at that time and it was over a hundred years ago now, it does not feel that long ago relative to our history and time spent on this earth. Oh boy. A ducking stool was basically a chair, a variation of another stool type used to humiliate people. However, in the case of the ducking stool, you were more than humiliated, you could actually die. Women would be tied to the ducking stool, basically a chair, and then lowered into the water. During the witch trials, this was one of the methods used to discern witches from innocent women. The problem being that witches would apparently survive the process thanks to their wily powers, whereas women would be proclaimed innocent if they could not float, swim, or survive this process, meaning that many that were then deemed innocent wouldn't survive the ducking process. So it seems like a flawed way to test that, you know what I mean? Like if someone's innocent, I feel like they shouldn't end up dead, but I don't know. Only the witches get to live, and even then they don't get to live. No one gets to live. Are you a woman? No life for you, sorry. You just gotta move on. That's history for you. Number two, foot binding. While not a punishment for any misdeed, foot binding was a cultural practice that has often been tied to sexist ideals for women that were created not necessarily by them, but by like society at large. The idea with foot binding was to break the bones of young girls' feet so that their feet could be shaped into a small and dainty size. From a young age, their feet were broken, bound, and conditioned so that they would be and remain small into adulthood. Well, no longer something practiced today, foot binding is an ancient practice that is believed to have originated somewhere around the 10th century. The decline began though around the mid 19th century. That's nine centuries of foot binding after questions were raised about the practice in the 18th century. Number one, nose cutting. Probably one of the most brutal punishments out there for suspected adultery or promiscuity is the method of nose and ear cutting. This is when women have their noses and or their ears removed. This is done to disfigure the woman and take away the power of her beauty as punishment for whatever misdeed she's accused of. In many cases, women have been punished in this way without even actually being proven to have done anything that is even deemed wrong by whatever moral code you're subscribing to by whatever whack moral code you are subscribing to. Some women have even been punished this way simply for defending or protecting themselves or others. Typically, nose cutting is reserved as a punishment for women. It happened not just in the 19th century, but before and even after that as well. Pony Express Rider. Now, if you're a Pony Express Rider, which is a very interesting title, in the 1860s, it was a demanding and perilous job. The Pony Express was a short-lived but iconic mail delivery service that operated between the east and west coast of the United States. 
While the Pony Express played a crucial role in communication during its brief existence, riders faced numerous risks and challenges. Pony Express riders covered vast distances across diverse and often treacherous terrains, including mountains, deserts, and open plains. The varied landscapes presented challenges such as a rough trail and steep hills and unpredictable weather conditions, and the need for speed in delivering mail meant that the riders had little time for rest. They had to cover approximately 75 to 100 miles in a single ride before handing off the mail to the next rider. This demanding schedule meant limited opportunities for sleep or breaks. Riding at high speeds across rough terrains increased the risks of accidents and injuries, falls, collisions with obstacles, or injuries from hostile encounters that were constant concerns for Pony Express riders. The life expectancies of a Pony Express rider was relatively short though due to the challenging conditions and risks associated with the job. As many riders were young and adventurous, while the job offered excitement, it also took a very huge toll on their health and well-being. Number 9. Farmer and Rancher Being a rancher in the Wild West was a challenging and often risky occupation. Ranchers played a vital role in the development of the Western frontier, contributing to the cattle industry and the expansion of settlements. However, they faced numerous challenges and risks, both in terms of natural environment and the social and economic conditions of the time. Cattle rustling was a prevalent crime in the Wild West. Outlaws and bandits would steal cattle, posing a direct threat to the economic livelihood of ranchers. Ranchers often had to take the measures of protecting their herds and property and conflicts could arise. Many ranchers were located in remote areas with limited access to infrastructure and services, and the expansion of ranches often encroached on traditional Native American territories. Tensions and conflicts between ranchers and Native American tribes were not uncommon, adding to an additional layer of risks to the occupation. But then again, I'm always on the indigenous people's side, so they had a point to fight. Beyond weather-related challenges, ranchers were vulnerable to disasters and natural disasters such as floods, earthquakes, and disease outbreaks among livestock. These events ha could have devastating effects on both the ranchers as well as their herds. Number 8. Saloon Owner and the Bartender If you wanted a career as a saloon owner or a bartender in the Wild West, well, like all occupations in this time came with its own set of risks and challenges, saloons were central to the social and economic life of a frontier town, but they also associated with a range of issues including lawlessness, violence, and economic uncertainties. Saloons were often rowdy establishments where patrons engaged in heavy drinking, gambling, and occasional brawls, and saloon owners bartenders face the risks of violence erupting within their establishments, leading to injuries as well as property damage. As well, some saloons attracted these outlaws and criminals seeking refuge or engaging in legal activities. Saloon owners could find themselves entangled with criminal events, leading to legal troubles and conflicts with law enforcement. Bartenders worked long hours in often challenging conditions, and dealing with unruly patrons and managing inventory and maintaining a clean and safe environment were constant tasks that required skills and resilience that are still very prevalent today for current bartenders. Number 7. Stagecoach Driver Stagecoaches were prime targets for bandits and highwaymen looking to rob passengers or steal valuable cargo. Drivers and passengers faced a constant risk of being ambushed alongside isolated stretches of the route. Stagecoach uh, routes transverse diverse landscapes, including mountains, deserts, and dense forest. Drivers had to navigate and rough Drivers had to navigate rough and sometimes hazardous terrains, dealing with obstacles such as steep inclines and rocky paths, and river crossings. Stagecoach drivers were exposed to the elements and had to contend with extreme weather conditions, including scorching heat, freezing temperatures, heavy rain, and snowstorms. These conditions made traveling challenging and added an extra layer of risk, and the stagecoach drivers worked long and grueling hours, covering vast distances in a single journey. The demanding schedule and physical toll of driving for extended period increased the risk of fatigue and related accidents, but despite the risk, stagecoach drivers almost fell down here, oh my god. <laughs> but despite the risk, stagecoach drivers played a crucial role in the westward expansion of the United States, connecting isolated communities and contributing to economic development of the frontier. Number 6. Prospector and Gold Seeker Being a prospector or gold seeker during the gold rush era in the Wild West was an adventurous but a very risky pursuit. It was obviously a huge time where gold was everyone's mind and the allure of striking it and rich attracted thousands of individuals to mining sites in search of gold and other valuable minerals. However, the life of a prospector came with numerous challenges and hazards. Mining sites were often located in remote and isolated areas far from established communities. Prospectors faced the risk of being cut off from civilization with limited access to supplies, medical assistance, or communication, and the challenging terrain and harsh weather conditions added to the physical demands of the job. Mining camps were notorious for poor sanitation and crowding living conditions. Prospectors were also at risk of contracting diseases such as dysentery, cholera, and other illnesses due to inadequate hygiene practices and limiting access to clean water. 
The process of extracting minerals from the earth involved potentially dangerous activities such as tunneling, blasting, and handling heavy machinery. Accidents such as cave-ins, explosions, or equipment failures could also lead to injuries or fatalities. Number 5, Blacksmith. I love playing Stardew Valley and Clint from Stardew is the best, but it always made me wonder how does one even get into blacksmithing? Well, being a blacksmith in the Wild West was a vital but demanding occupation. Alongside with the mining and prospecting, blacksmiths played a crucial role in the development of frontier communities, providing essential services such as forging tools, repairing equipments, and contributing to the growth of local economies. However, the life of a blacksmith was not without its challenges and risks as working with hot metal, sharp tools, and heavy machinery, the risk of burn cuts and injuries from handling red hot iron and heavy equipment was ever present. Sparks and fragments of hot metal created during the forging process could pose a risk to the eyes as they didn't have proper, you know, um, equipment. And without modern safety equipment, as I mentioned, blacksmiths were vulnerable to these eye injuries from flying debris. In the event of injuries or health issues, blacksmiths might not have had immediate or adequate medical attention. And despite the risk, of course, blacksmiths were highly valued members of frontier communities, contributing to the local economy and developing of essential tools and equipment. And of course, you do need a blacksmith if you're a cowboy cattle driver. Number four. The iconic image of a cowboy is often associated with the sense of adventure and independence, but the reality of the job came with numerous challenges and risks. However, I'd like to clarify, the image of cowboys in the American West is often associated with Euro-American cultural context, but it's essential to recognize that various indigenous people also had their own traditions of cattle herding and horse riding. Indigenous cowboys, often referred to as cowboys or horsemen, play significant roles in the ranching and livestock industries, contributing to the culture and economic developments of their communities. Before the arrival of Europeans, indigenous people in what is now Mexico and the southwestern United States had well-established traditions of horse riding and cattle herding. The Navajo Nation, located in the southwestern United States, had a long history of horsemanship, and the Navajo people traditionally relied on horses for transportation and herding livestock, including sheep and cattle. And of course, when it comes to being on the job, as this is what this video is on, I have to bring up the history. Outbreaks of illnesses such as Texas fever could devastate cattle herds, leading to economic losses and ranchers and cowboys. Number three, railroad worker. Again, do not be surprised when we talk about Wild West, I gotta bring up the whole racism part because <laughs> it was a thing as it is a thing now, whether you believe it or not. To some, when they think about railroad workers, they think of big barley guys with giant sledgehammers on the side of the tracks. But to me, I think about how the majority of the railroad workers were Chinese immigrants that came to the United States who at the time were treated with extreme work conditions that constantly risked their lives. Chinese railroad workers faced hazardous uh, working conditions during the construction of the railroad as they were involved in physically demanding tasks such as grading, tunneling, and laying the tracks, often in challenging terrains and extreme weather conditions. They are forced to live in close quarters facilitated with the spread of diseases such as cholera and smallpox, posing health risks to the workers. And of course, they face the discrimination and racial prejudice from other workers, local communities, and sometimes even from their own employers. This discrimination could lead to verbal abuse, harassment, and unfair treatment as the Chinese workers often receive lower wages than their non-Chinese counterparts for similar or identical work. The pay disparities reflected discriminatory practices prevalent during the construction of the transcontinental railroad as well as lived in isolated and segregated camps. Again, this is part of history whether you want it to or not or acknowledge it, but it's there if anyone wants to look into it and I do suggest you do look into it. Number two, minor. One of the most significant risks of being an underground miner was the potential of a tunnel collapsing and cave-ins. Poorly supported mine shafts and tunnels could collapse and burying miners under tons of rocks and debris. Mines were susceptible to fires, especially in coal mines where flammable gases could accumulate anytime, and miners were exposed to dust, fumes, and toxic gases leading to respiratory issues such as pneumoconiosis as well as other lung disorders. Loose rocks and debris in mine shafts poses a constant danger and rock falls and accidents involving hoisting equipment or elevator systems could lead to injuries or fatalities. During the Wild West era, safety regulations and measures were often insufficient and miners had limited access to safety equipment. And employers were not always diligent in implementing measures to protect their workers. Some mining processes involved in the use of hazardous chemicals such as mercury and cyanide, exposure to these substances could lead to long-term health issues for miners and environmental damage. And finally, number one, being a gambler or an outlaw. Being a gambler or an outlaw in the Wild West was a risky and often dangerous lifestyle. While popular culture has romanticized the heck of the image of gamblers and outlaws, the reality involved numerous challenges and hazards. Cheating was not uncommon in gambling establishments, and accusations of cheating could lead to violent confrontations. Disputes over winnings and losses sometimes escalated into violent weapon fights or physical altercations for outlaws, where by definitions, individuals who operated outside the law, this meant that they were constantly pursued by law enforcement, including sheriffs, deputies, and posses. 
The risk of arrest and incarceration was in a constant threat, and outlaws often engaged in violent activities, including bank robberies, stagecoach holdups, and pew pew fights. This lifestyle exposed them to the risk of injury or death in shoot uh, shootouts, yeah, with lawmen or rival gangs. If caught by law enforcement, outlaws faced the risk of imprisonment. Conditions in the frontier jails were often harsh, and sentence could be severe. Outlaws who gained notoriety often became public enemies, or public enemy number one, with bounties on their head, and this increased the risk of capture and heightened law enforcement's efforts to bring them to justice. Number 10, Thews or Stocks. Gossiping now is always seen as a bothersome and terrible construct where rumors are spread and information is sent from one end to the room to the other, when in actuality the original history of gossiping was used as a survival tool since time. However, due to the trickling events that would occur in the 12th century to the 21st century, gossip has been accompanied by the dangerous stigmatization of women. And with that in mind, they would be accompanied with a crime of humiliation for gossiping by being locked up by the neck and left outside at the mercy of the mocking crowd. The Thew was a type of Pillory similar to stocks specifically for women, and the woman would be chained to a post by her neck as a punishment for her crime. Unlike men, her hands weren't tied up, and common crimes include annoying your neighbors by talking too much or consummating outside of marriage. As for example, one woman named Anne Morrow in 1777, she was accused of impersonating a man and marrying another woman. She was put in the pillory and an angry crowd stoned her in resulting of her being blind. Number 9, Iron Cages. They really didn't like it when women gossiped, or in most cases talked back in the day, especially when she would speak up or just discuss things. But words can only help you unless you speak them, and it's disappointing when people fail to understand that. Women who nagged would have metal spikes forced into their mouths, and the scold bridle was an iron cage for a woman's face, used to punish scolds, women who nagged, gossiped, talked back, or just talked too much. The bridle would be locked onto your head, and the protruding piece of metal will cover in spikes would be forced inside your mouth. And every time you moved your tongue, the spikes would lacerate it. Sometimes the bridal woman would be chained to a hook by the fireplace in her home until she had learned her lesson. Or she might be led through town wearing the mask to increase her humiliation. Number 8, Duck the Scold. Unfortunately, another form of torment and punishment for women being tied to a chair at the end of a long, maneuverable wooden arm and dipped into frigid water. The punishment wasn't designed to be fatal, although sometimes it was, but rather a humiliating spectacle aimed at discouraging whatever behavior participated in. There were various rituals for silencing women, as they have their roots in fear of women's speech and fear that women will attack other people in their community, that they gossip too much, that their voices were dangerous, and that they may, in extreme circumstances, also be witches. Though the women who ended up being on the ducking stool risked being accused of witchcraft, and the punishment contrary to popular misconception wasn't used to determine whether someone was a witch. A separate test primarily known as the swimming witch involved throwing a bound victim into a body of water to see if they'd float, a sure sign of guilt in the modern imagination. Subjects who sank were deemed innocent but could still wind up dead if they weren't rescued from the water in time. Few records about the women who were ducked survived. Much more information is available about the ducking stools themselves, their upkeep, about how they were kept into their construction. Number 7, marking and tattooing. Although in some cultures tattooing isn't seen as a bad thing, but part of their heritage and even a source of pride. But in some cases, they would use it as a means of marking an individual for their shame. Nathaniel Hawthorne, the Scarlet Letter famously marks its protagonist, Hester Prine, with a red letter A for adultery for accusations about her behavior circulated. Hawthorne's book is more than fiction, as adulterers were really forced to mark their clothing to identify their crimes. Like Hester Prine, A or the letters AD as outlined by a Plymouth Colony law from 1658, adulterers seen publicly without their letters were subject to public whipping and even further humiliation and social alienation. But keep in mind, Hawthorne was the descendant of the judge Hathorne, who, pers who persecuted the lives of women who were accused of being witches, and he had such a disdain for his relative that he had changed his last name to distance himself from the relation of Hathorne from Hawthorne with a W. Number 6, Walk of Shame. Like in Game of Thrones, a pretty well known show, I don't know if you guys heard of it, I'm rewatching it again up to a certain specific season. But there was that scene where Cersei was condemned for her crimes and had that lady yell shame as she rung a bell while Cersei was left parading the streets stripped naked. This is actually based as a form of torment for women. Women, and the Walk of Shame, also known as Skimmington or Rough Music, was a traditional punishment for holotry or being an overbearing wife. Women were made to walk barefoot through the town or city, sometimes dressed only in their petticoat. Hmm. The street was filthy and sharp with rough stones, jeering crowds lined up to stare, and minstrels banging basins and pans would accompany the procession, adding to the woman's humiliation. Sometimes the skimmingtons were delivered by the townsfolk rather than the courts, and the accused might be dragged from their bed at night and paraded through the town with the crowd shouting obscene words at her. Unless she was quiet, subdued women who followed every little thing she was supposed to do, she would be looked down on. Number 5, Status Degration. Status Degration still persists today, and it's been used as a formal punishment throughout history. Under the Roman Emperor Augustus, who 
reigned from 27 BCE to 14 CE, a woman guilty of adultery could lose several rights as a citizen and suffer a financial burden. Noble women in the Kingdom of Korea during the Chosan dynasty faced a similar degradation of their social status if they were found guilty of adultery or if they just remarried. Adulteresses were stripped of many of their rights and privileges once they were demoted to low-born statuses, and the descendants of widows who remarried were barred from holding office. As serious as these punishments may seem, some high-status women who committed adultery in the Chosan dynasty faced even graver punishment, which is death. Number four, pricking and scratching. Another form of torment women had to endure as a type of punishment relates back towards one of the biggest torments women had to face during the witch trials. Witch hunting books and instruction pamphlets, yes, they had an Ikea manual on how to prick a witch, it noted that marks were insensitive to pain and they couldn't bleed. So they would make these specifically designed needles to repeatedly stab and prick at the accused flesh until they discovered a spot that produced their desired results. So basically they would just keep poking you with needles until there was an area on you that just didn't bleed. They even had a job position for this called professional prickers, which many of them would be con men using dulled needles points to identify fake witch marks. Alongside the pricking was the scratching where they would scratch the supposed victim, so if a victim scratches the accused witch with their fingernails and drew blood and their symptoms of being possessed stopped, then somehow that person that they scratched was a witch. Number three, tar and feathering. When I first heard about tar and feathering, it was in a cartoon where the characters would use tar and then feather the characters they wanted to make a fool out of. Tar and feathering originated as a punishment that dates back to Richard I of England. The practice of tarring and feathering was exported to the Americas, gaining popularity in the mid 18th century. Throughout the 1760s, it saw increased usages as a means of protesting the Townshed Revenue Act and those who sought to enforce it. For women, they'd also tar and feather as a form of embarrassment in a news article in 1906 consisting of four young married women from the East Sandy, Pennsylvania corrected the alleged evil conduct of their neighbor, Mrs. Hattie Lowry. Two women held Mrs. Lowry to the floor while the others two smeared her face with stove polish until it was completely covered and then poured thick molasses on her head and emptied the contents of a feather pillow over molasses. The women then marched the victim to a railroad camp tied by the wrist at where 200 workmen stopped to watch the spectacle. After parading Mrs. Lowry through the, cr the camp, the women tied her to a large box where she remained until a man released her. They did this because they wanted to be part of a vigilant committee which exercises the right to take up the law in their own hands. Reason why they did that to her though is still unknown. Justice for Mrs. Lowry. Number two, amputation. Although it may not seem to be as creative as the other instruments of torture on this list, amputation packed a painful and permanent punch. The body of an ancient Chinese woman from about 3,000 years ago had been found with an amputated feet but in otherwise good health. And all signs point to an ancient Chinese punishment called Yue which was used for over 500 different offenses including cheating and stealing. In ancient Egypt and the Byzantine Empire, a different type of amputation was common. Nose amputation called rhinotomy which was a punishment for adulterous women, though it was also used as a punishment for various crimes in medieval and ancient times elsewhere. However, the adulterous man might escape with a less severe punishment like a fine or a beating. Number one, burnt to death. Although it is noted that the most famous form of torment and method of getting rid of a witch was to burn her or burn them by the stake. But this was more common in Europe during the very early 1300s to the end of the 17th century. In England and most of their colonies, the witch trials would go on like every other crime and when someone was convicted of witchcraft, typically they would be hanged. But with the burning alive, that was more specifically used in Europe, especially in Scotland. Women accused of witchcraft and communing with the devil would be burnt, but it was also a common punishment for treason or heresy. A woman might have her limbs covered in tar, as well as being made to wear a tar-soaked dress and bonnet, and she would then be tied up by the neck on a barrel and the fire would be lit. She would be simultaneously burnt and hung in a blazing inferno, or they wouldn't bother to hang her. Instead, placing a bundle of twigs around her feet so she would be consumed in a sheet of fire and burnt alive. Notably, another famous person who was also in this unfortunate spectacle was Joan of Arc.